Um, okay, well, let's just start. Let's just okay. get into it. Let's just be natural. So, um, Professor Baker, Professor of Korean Civilization at the University of British Columbia. And I remember when I was doing my graduate studies that I would often come across your work related to oh. religions in Korea, especially Confucianism mm. and... It's kind of weird to be sat opposite you now, because it was always a name on paper, oh, and we met okay. each other for the first time last week. That's right. Mm. I, I, and now you're here. You're here in Korea. Yes. On the day of Sunung. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> we could be talking about many things, uh, Professor Baker, because you have so many, so much expertise. But we're going to talk today about Gwangju. Okay. Yeah. Um, because you've done a lot of work on Gwangju recently. It changed my life. Yeah. Yeah. Can we start, please, with just what is Gwangju? Because you and I mm. sort of have some idea of it, but let's unpack this word Gwangju. What is yeah. Gwangju? It's the largest city in the southwestern province of Jeonnam. Mm. It used to be the capital of Jeonnam until mm. uh, the late 1980s or 1990s. It's now an independent city, self-governing city. Uh, it's about 1.3 million people now. Mm. Um, the Jeonnam area traditionally has been less industrial than the rest of Korea, mostly agricultural. That's beginning to change, of course, as most of Korea is becoming industrialized. Mm. But when I was first there in the 70s, the, the, it was distinctively behind Seoul and um, and the Southeast in terms of in, industrial development. Yeah. Yeah, and so I, I was reading in one of your pieces that Gwangju has a reputation of being sort of underdeveloped, unsophisticated, or at least it did yeah. back in the 70s, you, you were saying that. It may still have that reputation. <laughs> yeah, There is this regional uh, rivalry between the southeast and the southwest, and mm. people in the southeast look down on on people in Gwangju as kind of country bumpkins. Mm. Uh, I still remember in 1972, I'd been in Gwangju for about a year, and I was over in Pusan for mm. something, I don't remember, and I was shopping, and I was using my Gwangju dialect, which I'd learned, mm. and a shopkeeper said, where'd you learn that? I said, well, I learned it in Gwangju. Oh, be careful. It's full of thieves, he said. Wow. I said, I love those people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to argue with him, so I didn't say anything. Um, it has a reputation of being politically radical, mm. uh, even before 1980. Um, it's, um, I, I, I know when people from Gwangju would move to Seoul, uh, they would try to change their accent because mm. it is – I grew up in the American South. I had to change my accent when I moved to the East Coast of the U.S. also. People hear that accent, they think you're under uneducated. Mm, you know? And yeah. so, how do people do that? Uh, and so it has, um, a lot of regions in Korea are famous for different foods and drinks. Mm. Is there, I was, you were, you were mentioning a lot of makgeolli back then, but <laughs> is there any foods like chuncheon dak galbi and jeonju yeah. bibimbap? Yeah. And- Gwangju people are really fond of their hongo skate. Okay, I know hongo. And... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I call myself a Gwangju person, but I'm, I'm sorry, I have trouble with Hongo. <laughs> Hongo is a type of fish, and it smells like ammonia. Right, it smells like cat pee, really and, strong, and it's very chewy. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but I also I love the Chunnam Jungshik, the set meals. You go yeah. to the countryside, yeah. and you put in an order, and come back two hours later, and you got a table full of so many different little small dishes. You can't. Yeah. All you can do is just get a taste of all the different dishes. It's incredible. Yeah. Look. I may be biased, but I think um, Chunnam has the best, in Gwangju has the best food in Korea, I think. Yeah, wow, mm-hmm. wow. And you've been there, can you give us a taste of the accent, or is that a bit hard? You've been away for a while. Like, oh, what? How's it, Johnny? <laughs> okay, okay. Instead of what sort of, mm-hmm. sorry, let's unpack that. Instead of Hesayo, they say Haso Johnny. Johnny, the incident says Johnny. Yeah. Uh, like when I, I met Kim Dae Jung uh, for the first time, I, I, I'd gone to the airport to pick him up, and I said, um, uh, teacher Kim, we called him Kim yeah. something new. I'm just showing, and he broke out a big grin. <laughs> but there's another a- aspect of the Kwangju dialect that's really useful when you're a foreigner learning Korean. Yeah. Uh, they say kushigi, uh-huh. uh, which is a filler word. It means what you call it, what's his face. Mm. Uh, it's in the dictionary as a pigeon mall, but nobody else uses it. it. My landlady would use it, for example, when sh- I'd go out with drinking with an American friend, and she would didn't know their name. She would say, "Oh, you want drinking with kushigi?" Or, or I could go to a little small store and I want to buy something, don't know the name of it. I'd say, how much is Kushigi? And they'd tell me. <laughs> wow. And so that's a, what you might call it? That's yeah, a thi- yeah. thingy magic yeah. or something. It's really handy when you're a foreigner not knowing all the words yet. <laughs> this is perfect for me. I'm going to write this down. <laughs> Kushigi. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the Kushigi. It's in the dictionary. <laughs> and um, you just dropped into, just casually there, Don, you just dropped. Oh, I went and picked up DJ. I went and picked oh, yeah. up Kim <laughs> Dae-jung from the, from the airport. Now, D, uh, Kim Dae-jung. 
uh, former president of right. South Korea, Nobel Peace Prize. He's probably one of the most famous Gwangjuians, or uh, however we yeah. might say that, is he? Or? Yeah, he's actually not from Gwangju, but okay. the people identify him with Gwangju. He actually grew up on an island off the coast, and then he had a business in Mokpo before he mm. got into politics. Mm. Mokpo, of course, is on the coast. But yeah, he's identified with Gwangju. Yeah. Um, if you're from Gwangju, you, have to support, you had to support Kim Dae-jung. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, what was he like in person? Did you meet him like before the accidents and the limps? Or? No, I met him when he was in exile in the United States in 1983. Oh, wow. uh, I invited him to the University of Washington to give a couple of lectures, one in English and one in Korean. Yeah. And I can tell you, he's incredibly charismatic. Yeah. In English, he was kind of dull. You okay. Know. okay. But in Korean, he was incredible. He would have the audience laughing one minute and crying the next. That's amazing. Yeah. He was incredible. Oh, what interesting story about that. Again, 1983, he's in exile. Mm. We had him in an 800-seat auditorium. Yeah. The first night was in English, and it filled up right away. Uh, second night for Korean, we waited. It was almost 8 o'clock when his speech was supposed to start, and the seats were mostly empty. Yeah. Then we turned the lights off, yeah. and then the Koreans came in because the Korean secret police were watching who was there. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It was full once the lights were off. Yeah. It, it must be such a, a psychological difficulty to know you're in exile or to know you're being watched. I can't imagine. I mean, I read stories about Sir Salman Rushdie and the fact yeah. it was against him, yeah. but to go through what he... Can you unpack a bit more of him for me? I, you well, know. well, I mean, he, again, he was, he, interesting man. He was both humble and arrogant. Arrogant okay. in that <laughs> he really seemed to believe that God had chosen him to save democracy for Korea. He was a strong Catholic, is that? A very strong Catholic. Yeah. Um, but he was also he come across as a very gentle, humble man. Yeah. But he was very self assured. He told me in 1983 yeah. that when he was president, <laughs> not if when, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and. What he told me that I'll never forget. Yeah. Uh, he told me he was going to do two things when he became president. Mm -hmm. The first thing was to abolish the death penalty. He says, I was on death row. I think people will understand. Mm -hmm. Now, the law is still in the books in South Korea, but nobody's been executed since he was president. Mm -hmm. Second thing he told me was a little more controversial to me at the time. He said when he became president, he was going to pardon Chun Doo Hwan, who was then president. <laughs> and he did that. Right, he did. Chun Doo Hwan was on death row. That's right. And he pardoned him yeah. and invited him to his inauguration. He did. Yeah. And I asked him, so why would you want to do that? And he said, we have to end this animosity between the Southeast and the Southwest. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I was really impressed with that. Although I still, I still said, look, I want Chun Doo Hwan in jail. <laughs> <laughs> he, he went to a Buddhist monastery for right. Right, three years for his right. penance. I right. Think. But I sometimes show my students that photo of Kim Dae-jung's inauguration, which was, what, 98, I think? Something like this. 98, yeah. 98, yeah. And there was Kim Yong sam there was No tae there right. was Chan Doo-won, all there. I know, and both No tae and uh, Chan Doo-won had been in jail. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. He also had Michael Jackson at his inauguration, I believe. But I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, remember. Michael Jackson. I'm not sure Michael Jackson would have known what was going on. <laughs> but I, I think that speaks something to Kim Dae-jung's charisma. Well, he is again incredibly charismatic. Yeah. Was, it, was he tall? Was he short? Like, what did he? How did he come across? Uh, about my height, which is not, I, back then I was tall <laughs> <laughs> for Korea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, maybe I, I don't know. Uh, he wasn't because I wouldn't call him a tall man. No. Okay, but not not noticeably short either. He was medium mm -hmm. height. Uh, it was mainly more charismatic, of course, when he gave public speeches. Yeah. Uh, but even one on one, I mean, he, there was something about him that you just you wanted to follow him anywhere, yes, you know, yeah. which people in Guangzhou were willing to do. You know, uh, they practically worshipped Kim Dae Jung. One thing, uh, his popularity came from the fact that uh, as the economy was developing and in, in the south, in Jinnam, the southwest was falling farther behind economically than the rest of the country, mm. Kim Dae Jung seemed to them to be. The, Give them the possibility of catching up. Yes. Yeah. And that's what they really wanted. Um, that's why they loved him so much. But also because he sacrificed so much for democracy, too. They, they really appreciated that. And he, he would be really nice to anybody that he met. You know, he'd mm -hmm. come across, he's a very powerful man, even when he's president, but he'd still be very nice to you, like, you're, like you were a friend. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of way he approached people. He's, he's a, a, a symbol of hope, not just for the people of Gwangju, but sometimes I get students when we talk about power and politics and they sort of say to me, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Mm. They do the Lord Act. And, and there you have Kim Dae-jung who was willing to forgive the people that gave him death sentences, yes. that tried to assassinate him. And even when he got all that power, he would say, I forgive you. That's right. And there is an example in our in in mm. Korean history that it's not always about revenge and, and mm. backstabbing, but somebody can get to the top position in the country and mm. say, I won't continue it. That's right. That's quite amazing that he did that. Yeah. yeah. By the way, uh, Korea has an amazing history. I teach modern Korean history, right? I like yeah. to tell my students yeah. 
especially if there's any Americans in the class, that Korea has sent four former presidents to jail. I said, America should learn that. <laughs> <laughs> Are you speaking about any one particular? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> We've just given one of our former presidents, the man responsible for the Brexit referendum, he was in the House of Lords. We've just made him the foreign secretary. I saw that. Uh, former Prime Minister David Cameron. So, yeah. uh, yeah. I was kind of surprised at that. But Politics <laughs> moves. Uh, South Korea also had the first formally, uh, the first... Uh, elected woman president in, in East Asia, they put her in jail as well, so they're not sexist. <laughs> oh, they, that is true. They, they don't mind how they do this. Um, let's go back to Guangzhou a little bit. And mm. you went there in, in, in 71? 1971, fall of 1971. Oh, That's right. come on. So I've heard people tell me a little bit about Seoul in, in, in things like this. Can what was Guangzhou like? Was it fields? Was it were you in countryside? Was it a city? It was a city of, of about half a million. Okay. Um, there were no high rises, of course. There was no uh, underground rapid transit system. Yeah. Uh, there was one Western food restaurant that had hamburger steak, hamburger oh, wow. steak we called it. Yeah. yeah. Um, we got really excited when they started selling uh, Scotch whiskey there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was it the Valentine? The, they always love the Valentine whiskey here. I for some reason. Yeah, okay, but sorry. I, used to, I, I was a Peace Corps volunteer. I was an American then, now I'm Canadian. Yeah. Uh, and we, we were paid the same as our Korean co workers, and I taught at a, at a middle school. Mm. So I didn't have a whole lot of money, so I drank Makali. Mm. That's why I drank Makali. Yeah. And I tell people I learned to speak Korean in a Makali house. Yeah, <laughs> best place to learn, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh, it was a tough city at first. The only foreigners there, there was a U.S. Air Force base outside of town. Mm. The people from there didn't come into town very often. There were American missionaries who mm. tended to stay on their compounds. Yeah. And so they didn't know what we were. You know, there, there were five of us Peace Corps volunteers that came down together. And they would yell insults at us thinking we didn't know Korean. And it was, you know, um, Migu Nome, you know, American yeah, yeah, Beast yeah, yeah, is what it was yeah. called. American but, Bastard, something yeah. like that would be. Yeah. But after about six months, they kept seeing me, yeah. you know, and I could speak enough Korean to tell them, look, I live down the street, you know, I live with a Korean family, yeah. and I teach in a Korean school. Oh, you're a friend. Let's have a drink. <laughs> you know. It's a good way to make friends, isn't oh, yeah, it? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So it was a tough place to... Uh, t- to be accepted, but once I have some really, I still have friends from that time. Nice. Uh, once we got past that initial barrier, yeah, you know, they were really friendly, partly because they were used to being looked down on by the rest of Korea, mm. and the fact that I was willing to live with them and learn their language, their dialect, mm. um, and eat their food, which was again the best food in Korea, I think, uh, it made them really appreciate me. I think mm. I sometimes associate the Korean left with. Panmi, with the anti-American. Right, right. Was there any of that, or did they see you as someone different because you weren't a soldier? Or there it, wasn't any anti-Americanism per se in yeah. Guangzhou in '71. That came after 1980. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, there was anti-foreign in a sense. They didn't want. Well, first of all, they didn't want um, Western men dating Korean women. Okay. <laughs> they didn't want that. You failed that one. I <laughs> yeah, I failed that one. <laughs> uh, and they, uh, you know, they, and, and again, they. I think there was a, a interesting kind of animosity towards, uh, they, they liked our culture, yes. but they, they saw us as sort of uncivilized because we didn't always act in a perfectly Korean way, mm. you know. Mm. Uh, the hardest thing, of course, for us when we start learning Korean, I'm sure you know too, is learning to use the proper social registers to talk up and down to people. And yes. I, I was always making mistakes with that, right? Yeah. And if people don't understand what a, what, what a language learner is going through, they feel insulted sometimes, right? Yeah. So that's a problem. Um, but but again, they they got used to us, and uh, I'm the only. I, I stayed a third year. Peace Corps is usually two years. Yeah. Most of my fellow uh, Peace Corps volunteers stayed for two years. Although one fellow came in a year after me is still there. Still there. <laughs> he became a professor at Joseon University, and he's retired from there. And he he runs the I think the International Center for Kwangju or something. Do you now. know his name? Yeah, David Schaefer. David Schaefer. Okay, there's mm-hmm. a name that I've yeah. Yeah, very that's... active in Tesla. A good friend of mine. Yeah, yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah. Why did you stay? I wanted to get my language a little bit better. Yeah. Um, I I'd already decided when I was in Guangzhou I wanted to go to graduate school in Korean studies. Yep. And I felt like I needed another year to bring my language up a level enough that I could really start doing some serious work. Yeah. But then I got to University of Washington to start my uh, master's program then, and they put me in second year Korean <laughs> 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 because I could speak conversational, yeah. but my reading ability wasn't quite high enough, right? Because <laughs> when you were drinking Macaulay with your friends, you were <laughs> reading, you were, you were speaking. Yeah. We weren't yeah. reading the newspapers then, though. <laughs> what was it like getting to grips with the culture? Uh, what was the culture like coming from the south of America? You said? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was it like getting to do with, was, I, I, 
you know Confucianism. Right, right. <laughs> Did you have to learn Confucianism? Confucianism doesn't exist? Give me that aspect, Don. Well, I, mean, I had to learn <clears throat> to show respect for people that are older. Yes. And I also had to learn to talk, <clears throat> excuse me, talk down to students. <laughs> mm-hmm. Except when they're in a group. Then you talk polite. Even teaching, talking to the whole class, you're polite. Yeah. One-on-one, you talk down. Yeah. Uh, and... Um, you know, we're very individualistic in the U.S. and have to get yeah. used to the, um, the, the commutarian, the, the notion of the group is primary. Mm. I still remember, I guess it's Guangzhou, 1972, I said something negative to my landlady about the, the U.S. president then, Richard Nixon. And she goes, mm. how can you say that about your president? Mm. You know, you don't yeah. do that in a Confucian yeah. society. Yeah, that's right. And also the way the Korean students studied. And it was, it still is kind of this way, it's memorization. Yes. Right. Yeah. And I wasn't used to that. Uh, I would say, look, why don't you just learn to, if you want to learn English, learn to talk it. They would, in my school, they would, I worked with a Korean teacher, mm. and we had a textbook that was conversational, but the Korean teacher would ask the students to stand up and recite both sides of the conversation. Good morning, how are you? Fine, thank you, and you? <laughs> <laughs> that's where they get because that's a joke now. I'm fine, thank you, and you. It's still yeah. part of the, <laughs> yeah. Um, there's one thing that I've missed here, Don, which is, I think it was when I was reading your work, forgive me if I'm incorrect here, but you said you weren't allowed to go to China. So I oh, right. I, I never yeah. knew this at the time. So Korea was sort of like, we're jumping back a couple of years to 71 here, but you're interested in Taiwan and China, but you weren't allowed to go to China. So Korea was like the necessity. Right. I'd originally been in Chinese studies yeah. and I got into that kind of an accident. I was in Louisiana yeah. and saw a notice on a bulletin board at my university that... Uh, if you wanted to study Chinese, you just go, but it would pay your way to Hawaii. And I said, I don't care about China. I want to go to Hawaii. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was a one-year program. Uh, they had to come back to Louisiana. And so I wanted to get back to Asia. And I didn't have any money. Mm-hmm. And so I heard about Peace Corps. And Peace Corps didn't – I was an American citizen then. Mm-hmm. And Americans couldn't go to China then. Mm-hmm. Nixon had not yet regularly normalized relations. Yeah. Uh, Taiwan didn't have Peace Corps. Mm-hmm. So I thought, oh, how different can Korea be? I had no clue. <laughs> is the Peace Corps, because I've spoken to so many people from Peace Corps, and I've the, is it a religious thing? Is oh, it no. a pacifist thing? Or how does no. it, is it just called Peace Corps? Is it's government. Uh, it's government. It was okay. established by, Senate, by President uh, John Kennedy. Okay. Uh, and the idea was that we would live with the people. Yeah. Um, we'd, uh, teach, we'd offer them some kind of skill. Mm. In my case, it was teaching English. Others worked in the local... Um, Rural rural health centers, tuberculosis checks, right. and things like that. I was reading from. Yeah. yeah, and what was good about that? You, a lot of people back then, you have to take those uh, tuberculosis medicine for a long time, mm-hmm. and people will stop taking it, which mm-hmm. builds up resistance. So you get this Peace Corps volunteer to hike out into the remote village and say, "I came all the way from America to tell you take your medicine." <laughs> <laughs> That'd be quite scary, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, as an yeah, American, yeah, standing yeah, over you. Yeah. yeah, but the embassy wasn't happy so much with Peace Corps. They were afraid we, living with the people would get in the trouble. You know. Oh. Okay. Um, and it didn't really happen, but they, they didn't realize that we were t- trained before we came to Korea. We had mm. 10 weeks of language training plus cultural training. Mm-mm-mm. It wasn't quite enough, but it was enough to help us keep out of trouble most of the time. Yeah. So, and, and you certainly did engage with the people. You, know, you, you got right amongst it. You drank with them. You, oh, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, you ate with them. You spoke with them. You worked with them. What was Because we'll eventually come to it, what was the politics of Guangzhou like? What huh. was it like? Was there, did you have to wake up every morning and do the exercises at six o'clock? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I hated that. I hated that. <laughs> Could you just give us some of that? What was that like in Guangzhou in the early 70s? What was the politics like, Don? It wasn't as radical as we see later. Okay. Uh, there was, again, resentment of the Southeast yeah. uh, for monopolizing both good government posts and, mm. and, and, um, and the economy. Yeah. Um, even later, uh, w- when I first went to Canada, there was a delegation of 50 top Korean business leaders, CEOs, mm. coming to Canada to promote business with Korea. Yeah. Fifty. Three were from Guangzhou area. Yeah. There are nine provinces, right? Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, things like that. That was So some resentment. Yeah. And occasionally people in Guangzhou would say things like, why don't we stop sending them our rice? <laughs> you know, because we were the rice bowl of Korea, basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They were joking, of course. Uh, mm-hmm. they, they did vote. In the 1960s, yeah. Chun, Chun Nam voted for Park Chung Hee. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That, that, he, he was a farm boy. Yeah, right? yeah right. Uh, but that changed with Kim Dae Jung. Okay. Mm-hmm. And especially when Kim Dae Jung was being basically persecuted by Park Chung Hee. So yeah. that, that's, that's, that's when Kwang Ju became identified more with the left, I think, when Kim Dae Jung became the challenger to Park Chung Hee. 
Guangzhou is the rice bowl, or that area is the rice bowl of Korea. Yeah. Because I was reading something that it's it's the rice, it's the act of uh, collecting rice, which is a collective action. It's That's not right. something that you can do that results in the collectivism. I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, I used to teach a course for all of Asia. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I would try to explain that the collectivist attitudes of, of um, Asian countries is because rice is the primary crop. And mm. you. It's not like um, rearing uh, sheep or, right. or, or even wheat. You, you've got to work together yeah. uh, as, a, as a small community, yeah. and it does create a stronger sense of being mutually interdependent. Yes, you know, and, um, and, and of course, Confucianism reinforces that. And Koreans will tell you now they're not Confucian. They are, <laughs> in many ways. <laughs> and they have the Mahayanan Buddhism here, which is also that kind of collective that's form it, of Buddhism, true. rather than the Theravadan, that's right. isolated in the hills. That's true. Can you give me Confucianism in a sentence? <laughs> we'll get back to Guangzhou, but is Confucianism the bowing and the deference to hierarchy? And uh, is it any yeji or? Yeah. I would say Confucianism is about everyone getting along harmoniously by playing their proper assigned role. Yeah. The roles are hierarchical. Um, but we all get a chance, like when I was young, I had to speak up to my teachers, but now I'm the teacher. Yes. <laughs> right? Um, so it's, it's, it's subordinating your personal self-interest to the needs of your community, whether it's your family or your village or your country. Yeah. That's what it's all about. And ritual is very important because in ritual, you learn to do whatever you're supposed to do in that ritual, regardless of what you personally want to do. Yeah. It's a way of training you in collective consciousness. Yeah. That's yeah. The kind of the, the yeah. Even if you have personal feelings towards the person, you must bow, you must show the deference with your actions. Exactly. Everything's in the external. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that kind of play the role is the, the rectification of names. Exactly like right. That whenever your thing's in the right place. Yeah. I remind my students, they're students they have to study. My job is to profess. <laughs> <laughs> It's is that hard getting used to because in the West, I mean, right. even in the the South of England, we grew up reading as, uh, alongside Shakespeare uh, and Samuel Beckett, but um, To Kill a Mockingbird and, mm -hmm. and the character of Atticus Finch and that you have this steadfast single character that's right. the same in your backyard, is the same in the courtyard, in yeah. the courtroom. Right. And, and you realize that idea of an unchanging self is, is quite Western, actually. It is very, quite Western, yeah. yeah. I've done a lot of work on Perhaps that. Perhaps even Christian, you know, it has that idea of the soul. And over here, you're always changing. I, I read in this book examining a uh, Gen Z generation that there was this data that showed those who have a more authentic sense of self across all their relations have a higher form of happiness or they have a higher degree of huh. happiness. Interesting. Well, I've written about how I think in Korea the self is composed of not not, not a, a separate and distinct unchanging soul. The self is nothing but the combination of all the different roles you play. Mm. Every individual is unique because we all have different relationships. Mm. Yeah. But nevertheless, we're defined by those roles. I'm defined by the fact I'm a professor, I'm a husband, yes. you know, and so on. Yeah. I'm a Canadian. Uh, all that defines me. Um, and I think in Confucianism, you're made consciously aware of that. Yes. You know, whereas in the West, we want to emphasize, I'm an individual. Yeah. yeah. And this is who I am, and I will always be like this, and that authenticity in that. Yeah. Right. But here, it's just always changing roles and flipping and switching, right. and, and that's yeah. what you're meant to do. Yeah. Um, you know, the French psychoanalysts say it's masks all the way down. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing there, like turtles all the way right, down. Right. It's just masks, masks, yeah. masks yeah. upon masks. And, yeah. and that's what it is. Um, before... You left Guangzhou, Guangzhou in, in seventy four. Yeah, in seventy four. Before you left, yeah, you got married. You, you took your. I, 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 she, I don't. Know. She's not. She's not from that period. Oh, okay, I met her later. Actually. Oh, okay. I didn't know. I was yeah. just reading this work yeah, yeah. here. Yeah, she was not my student at junior high school. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me for asking questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you you went back to the United States, right, to study for graduate school. Yeah, and you did your graduate school, and then. You came back. You, well, you had the, you know. Well, well, first of all, I had to come back to write the dissertation. I was lucky enough to go yeah. to the University of Washington, at that point had yeah. the best Korean history program in North America. Okay. Both Korean historians at Harvard are University of Washington PhDs, oh, okay. and they were they studied with me. Mm. We studied together. Um, but I had to come here uh, to do my research. So I came back as an American citizen still on a Fulbright grant. Okay. Which, yeah. which is what it was from 78 to 80. Oh. Yeah. What was Korean studies like in the mid-70s? Because I, my experience yeah. is in the 2000. What was Korean studies in the There weren't that many of us. Right. Um, back then, the Koreans who came to North America uh, to get a PhD would tend to get a degree in political science. Mm -hmm. They tried to get a good government job and they went back. Right. They didn't find many people in business administration or engineering. 
Um, and, and there were very few of us non-Koreans. Mm-hmm. We would go to the Association for Asian Studies meetings. And there might be, out of 120 panels, three on Korea. And then we would get together around a couple of tables in a restaurant. Mm-hmm. You know, that was yeah. it. Yeah. I even knew the when I was a professor, I even knew the advanced graduate students, mm-hmm. you know, in the 80s. Uh, now it's impossible. There's too many people out there. Uh, but back then it was a very close-knit group. There wasn't much for us to read in English. Mm-hmm. There wasn't a whole lot of scholarship out there. Mm. Uh, so we, we had to learn to read the Korean scholarship, of course. Mm. And again, one reason I had to come here was not just to use the libraries here, but to meet the Korean professors. Yeah. They helped me with, with my PhD. Yeah. Is there a different understanding of Korea in Korea and the United States? Does it, does it change whether you're writing or... Yeah. How does that work, Don? I would say that Koreans are interested in studying their own ancestors. Yeah. And there's a little bit of nationalism in there, right? Yeah. Whereas uh, they're not my ancestors. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm, I'm willing to look more at Korea's interactions with Japan and China, for example, over the centuries. That's dangerous. Yeah, I know. I know it can be. Yeah. Uh, and and being asked different questions. Yeah, um, yeah. I gave a lecture yesterday at a Korean university on North American scholarship on uh, on Korean history, yeah. and they weren't aware that Westerners now are doing more work on Joseon Dynasty women Confucian philosophers than apparently is being done in Korea. Wow. <laughs> yeah. now, I'm not sure why, but uh, I mean, these are some of these scholars are Koreans working in the West, but they're in yeah. the West. I, I think it reflects the change in America, doesn't it? The focus on gender, the I focus, think, of, yeah. and some of it might sometimes be anachronistic. You know, we project yeah. into the past what yeah. we're going through in the present, yeah. and yeah. identity and gender and sexuality and race yeah. are becoming big issues. So yeah. we, we we look into the past. I yeah. don't know. That's just an assumption. Well, we're also finding fascinating information. There's a woman at George Washington University, Jisoo Kim, yeah. who looked into the legal system and found out that women had a lot more legal agency than we would expect. Uh, women could initiate legal action, even slave women. There was a slave woman whose husband had been mistreated. Mm. I mean, he was a commoner, but had been a slave, and his former owner mistreated him. She complained to the government. Wow. Women well, have that kind of agency. Wh- when are we talking with this? We're talking about 18th century, 19th century. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, they were legal persons. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, uh, and tr- the problem they ran into, you're supposed to s- submit a legal complaint in classical Chinese. Mm. And very few women knew classical Chinese. Mm. So they would hire somebody to write the thing for them. Eventually, the government began accepting complaints from women in Korean. Mm. Which is, I, I had no idea until right. Jisoo found this information out. Yeah. yeah. Maybe what it, there's a Russian proverb that I love, which is the past is unpredictable. Yeah. <laughs> and the past will be changing. Yeah. Because yeah. as I understood it, the, um, the sort of the slave population of Joseon was about. It reached a forty percent high water mark in the seventeen hundreds, and then started dropping away. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, and then, um, yeah. please correct me because I, I, I like to be corrected so I can teach, profess to other people. And then, <laughs> the turn to Neo Confucianism, yes. like halfway through the Joseon Dynasty, yeah. was what really took women off the Jokbo and the family yeah. registers. And yeah. So it wasn't the whole Joseon period that women were. They, I mean, they adopted Neo Confucianism at the beginning of Joseon, but it took until the sixteen hundreds for it really to impact family structure. Mm. That's when women lost their inheritance rights. Mm. Uh, because um, in Kodio Dynasty, which precedes Joseon, sons and daughters could both be responsible f- for the Chesa, the ancestor memorial service. Mm. But that's against Neo Confucianism. Uh, and so as women lost the right to host the ancestor memorial service, they lost their claim to have some of the family property so they could mm-hmm. afford to host that service. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so that's why they were denied their, um, a share, as, as much of a share. They got some inheritance, but as much of a share. Mm-hmm. Uh, they would get a few slaves, a little bit of land, but not like their old, just the older brother would get. So it was a slow process. Uh, Confucianism did confine women, upper class women. We have to distinguish upper class women from commoners. Yes. Upper class women to their homes most of the time. It's the anbang? Yes. The, right, the right. inside room or yeah. something. And they wore these these coverings over their whole face when they went out. It's if they had to go out during the day. Changot, yeah, I believe yeah. it's called. They were really covered. It's like yeah. a hijab or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The commoners didn't do that. Mm-hmm. Were they open-breasted or is that propaganda? No, they were. <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, Chae Wall, who's a, a, a Korean historian, who's, by the way, going to be the next president of the Association for, for Asian Studies, which is a major post. Uh, she um, talked about um, uh, reading missionary writings. There was one missionary woman, American woman in the late 19th century, who was very upset whenever she'd see these uh, Korean women running around with their breasts exposed because yeah. Korean women, that's a way of saying, I have a son. I have a child. <laughs> oh, oh, that's what it was symbolizing. It was yeah. symbolizing the need to breastfeed. Right. And particularly a boy. Yeah, right. Particularly oh, a boy, of wow. course. And to the, the missionary woman who go up to pull their blouse down, and, and the Koreans said, you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> 
is the is the Joseon was are we right to look back on the Joseon dynasty with some apprehension with some praise because it feels weird for me whether we're meant to mm. look back on that as it's the same as an English man looking back to Victorian times okay. and attitudes towards yeah. you know sex and things like that how, how are we meant to understand that 500 years Don? Okay. Well I am a Jocelyn historian. That's uh, why I'm yeah, asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and my mentor was James Pellet who wrote a book back in when is it published uh, 1980s yeah. uh, in which he argued that rather than asking why did Jocelyn fall to the Japanese mm. Why don't we ask how it managed to last 500 years? Yeah, yeah. That's, pretty, that's the only group I can think of in Europe are the Habsburgs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's a pretty good record. And there was slow change over that period. It wasn't, he doesn't say that it was stagnant. It wasn't. It, was, it wasn't as rapid a change as we see, for example, in China or Japan or mm-hmm. Europe. Mm-hmm. But there was slow change. There was a, um, slow growth and sort of social mobility, not to the Yangban class, but more people were becoming Slaves were buying commoner status, for example, mm-hmm. uh, after, after the, the Japanese invasion of the 1590s. Um, and so we, we look at Joseon, they, unlike both Japan and China, mm-hmm. they had very few peasant rebellions. In fact, the first major nationwide, or almost nationwide, peasant rebellion mm-hmm. was 1890s. Wow, is the Donghak coming through? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And China had massive peasant rebellions 2,000 years earlier. Mm-hmm. And Japan also had them. Uh, and does that mean maybe the peasants were too weak from not enough food to rebel? Or uh, and It looks like it wasn't the most prosperous society, but yeah. people had enough to eat. They didn't feel the need to rebel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. And I, I believe it was through maybe Dave C. Kang that I first got this idea mm. of looking at Asia and Korea differently because it had so much stability. You know, while the West were, or Europe in yeah. particular was yeah. going to war at each other, yeah. left, right, and center, there's 500 years almost of stability. Yeah. There was a professor at UBC who's now retired, named Alex Woodside. Especially, was actually Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, but he wrote a book called Early, I think it's Early Modernities, um, and it's based on lectures he gave at Harvard. And it's he compares China, yeah. Korea, and Vietnam yeah. as more modern than other cultures at the time because they had early centralized bureaucratic governments. Mm-hmm. Think of Europe 600 years ago. Yeah. They, didn't, they, would, they were still coming out of feudalism, yeah. right? Yeah. And Korea had a centralized government. And of course, the young man, if you had any hope of getting a high government post, you had to come from the right family. You had to choose your parents properly. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, you, had, you didn't inherit the post. You got it by passing this exam. And that's very unusual. They got that different China. Meritoc- uh, meritocracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Japan didn't have that. Yeah. Uh, and so he argues that politically, anyway, Korea was early modern mm-hmm. in Chosun because they had this centralized government with the bureaucracy. That's mm-hmm. fascinating. Mm-hmm. Can I uh, ask you a difficult question? Mm-hmm. What was the relationship between Korea or, or Joseon and China? Yeah. Tributary states. Wherever, in, yeah. You know why I'm asking oh, this yeah. question? Because mm-hmm. people ask me, and I, well, China had an emperor. And Korea had a king. And right. That explains it, doesn't it? Or? Pretty much. But Korea couldn't call themselves ruler and emperor until the tributary election ended in 1894. Yeah. Um, right now, if you tell, talk to a Korean and use the term Sadejui, meaning serve the great, yeah. that's a derogatory term. It wasn't yeah. then. Okay. People were very proud by serving the great, meaning China. They showed they were part of the civilized world. Right. Uh, Korea ranked nations on a scale of civilization from most civilized China to least civilized, depending on how Chinese you were. Mm. For example, they respected people of Okinawa, which was independent for a while, uh, more than they respected Japanese, because Okinawans were more Confucian in their eyes. Mm. Um, and so, and also we forget the tributary system worked well for Korea. I mean, Korea had to offer a tribute, but usually the, the tribute missions would bring back gifts from the Chinese emperor worth more than they brought to China. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also, um, as a tributary state of China, they could call on Chinese assistance when the royal family was in trouble. Mm. It wasn't the country, it was the royal family. <laughs> that was the obligation. But it, they called on the Chinese in the 1590s. Mm-hmm. To help yes. yep. And they couldn't call on the Chinese again in the 1620s and 30s because the Chinese couldn't handle the Manchu either. But mm. uh, they, they could do that. Of course, they, in the 19th century, it didn't work anymore either because China wasn't strong enough. Uh, but basically what they got from the tributary relationship was, first of all, access to the latest developments in China. Mm. But... Um, philosophical and literary, but also, you know, in technology that China was coming up with. Uh, but they also got protection. Yes. You know, and really, 500 years, Koreans like to say Korea's always had a rough time and invaded. 
No, they haven't. <laughs> Talk to people in Poland. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There is that idea to to play up how they've always been the victim and suffering right, of all right. these invasions right, and right. every little pirate thing is, is right. one. But right, yeah, right. Stability. Yeah. When did it? I sometimes read old books, Don, and it was yeah. always called the. Yi dynasty. That was the family that ran it. That's why. Yeah. yeah, but when did that change? Because we're talking about the Joseon dynasty right. in the seventies. Right. Did right. you call it the Joseon dynasty? No, we called it the Yi dynasty when I was first in grad school. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, I guess in nineteen eighty. Because Koreans said, "Wait a minute, it wasn't the personal property of the Yi family. Actually, it was, but they said it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and so you want to call it Joseon. Yeah. Uh, but we call the, the last ruling period in Japan, in pre-modern Japan, the Tokugawa period. Yes, Tokugawa. that's right. But we do call China. Uh, Ching and our, our Chung Nala, uh, not not no call her Manchu. Um, That's right. But I think Chosun is a little bit better, I guess. But it it, it I mean, cause the, but the E family did actually rule, you know, for those five hundred years, yeah. which is pretty amazing. It, mm-hmm. it is, yeah. It's an incredible rule. And uh, is there anything just before we get back to Guangzhou, just while we're here, is there anything that people misunderstand or get wrong? Is there something that you see people commonly say about? the Joseon dynasty or Korean history, and you're just sitting there as a historian shaking your head going, that's not right. <laughs> People, when they want to talk about why Joseon fell at the 500 years, yeah. they want to either blame Confucianism or yeah. blame the stubbornness of the ruling elite for not adopting Western ideas, new ideas. And I wish they'd realized two things going on. First of all, in the 19th century, the royal family stopped producing strong kings. They had a series of child kings. I heard Gojong was a very indecisive ruler, and right, he was right. a lot to blame in his relationship with his father <laughs> and, <laughs> oh, his, and his wife, and it was uh, all my, like a, a sago or a right, gay drama. Yeah, yeah, the in-laws are playing a major role in the government in the 19th century. Yeah. Um, that's one reason, but I think a more important reason, and I've never seen any, any historian uh, write this up, but it seems to me that Joseon did not have the financial means mm. to modernize quickly enough mm. uh, to be able to defend itself against Japan. And it wasn't their fault. Both in Japan and China, you had a much more developed commercial sector because of the geography. Right. Japan is a very long country with an inland sea. Mm. Uh, and so you could grow stuff in the north, people in the south wanted, and vice versa. Uh, in China, they have, again, it's a huge country, and you have the Grand Canal to bring stuff back and forth. Water is the cheapest form of pre-modern transportation of goods. Mm. Uh, Korea didn't have two things. Didn't have the great geographic diversity, a little bit, but not a whole lot. Mm. And it didn't have a good internal translation system. Tax grain from the south southern coast was brought by boat to Seoul. Wow. The roads weren't wide enough to bring the stuff up. Yeah. They had one road going between Seoul and Pusan. That was about it. Mm. That's why they have these A-frames. These, they, they had to carry, the roads weren't mm. wide enough for carts. Mm. Most roads in Korea, Seoul was obviously an exception, the city of Seoul, but the roads between towns were so narrow, you couldn't have a cart. Mm. And so it meant no commercial economy developed, which means you don't have the kind of economic surplus you would need to modernize quickly. Mm. And Japan and China both had very active commercial sectors. Right. And so I think it's, if people say, oh, the, the Koreans were stupid, they didn't get into business, they did not have the geographic incentive. Mm-hmm. And also, the Korean Peninsula was kind of off the world trade routes. Mm-hmm. China mm-hmm. had always been part of world trade. Mm-hmm. Um, and even Japan a little bit. I mean, Japan had Dutch living in Nagasaki during the Tokugawa period. Mm-hmm. But nobody wanted to visit Korea back then, right? So they didn't have these foreigners showing up. Let's do business. They didn't have that. Mm. And so it wasn't really their fault, I Mm. think. um, King Kojong actually wanted to modernize. Seoul was one of the first places in Asia to have electric lights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, of course, he built that... um, the, the train, train line, yeah, the the tram, tram, yeah, tram, yeah. yeah to, to his wife's tomb. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, I mean, if he'd had the financial resources available, um, and if he'd have had a cooperative bureaucracy, because there were a lot of old guys who were kind of you know, wedded to the old system, um, Korea might have been able to maintain this independence. But the money wasn't there, and there was no World Bank then, mm. nobody to give him money. Right. right? Mm-hmm. And, and the world seemed to recognize Japanese civilization by the Japanese colonizing, they demonstrated they were part of civilization rather than outside of it, I, as I understand. That's right. To be a civilized nation, the beginning of the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th, you had to have colonies. Yeah. And unfortunately for Japan, most of the colonies were already taken, so they grabbed the neighbor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they grabbed Taiwan first and then Korea. But that's right. And um, 
Alexis Dundon, who teaches at University of Connecticut, has written a book showing that the Japanese studied international law to make sure that the rest of the world would see their seizure of Korea as legal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They knew how to use the law that way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they were supported through the Tafkatsura Agreement right, with right. the Philippines. This right. was 1905, around 1905, there. 1905, yeah, yeah. 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 What can we say, just while we're here, let's just keep moving through the time about Japanese colonization, because I'm sometimes afraid to talk about it. Yeah, yeah, it's a very sensitive subject. It is, it is yeah. though, isn't it? And yeah. is it right to be sensitive? Because I'll just say one thing about it, Don, which is coming from Europe and you know, everything that we've gone through, I sometimes bring a European perspective to it. Mm -hmm. And I say, like, you know, we had the Marshall Plan and we got the French and the Germans together. And yeah. we, we might sing a few songs at the football, <laughs> but ultimately <laughs> now we get on with right. each other and right. we've learned to forgive and forget the, the millions that lie in the fields right. uh, and, and we commemorate it and so why can't these countries but is, is that a ro that's the wrong perspective I think isn't it yeah yeah. I think yeah. there's a lot of history before even the Japanese takeover for centuries the Koreans looked down on Japanese as barbarians that's because they were further from civilization right. because they were island people is that island people and military uh, military always ranked below the civilian elite and Japan was ruled by warriors as this Hanong Gongsang and the Somri right, that right, kind of thing right, yeah. yeah and so that was one reason and then the Japanese were much rougher to the Koreans than they were to the Taiwanese okay. uh, Taiwanese were never made to change their family names mm. and Japanese did that because Japanese were really try trying to absorb Korea they, they told the Koreans you are a lesser version of our culture they, Taiwanese, they said, oh, you are Chinese. Mm. You have a Chinese culture. That's okay. Mm. We respect mm. that. Mm. Uh, so there's lack of respect for Korea. But one of the problems when discussing the colonial period, most people want to believe that everybody in Korea resisted. No. <laughs> there was a lot of collaboration, mm. if you want to call it that. People working with the Japanese. You had to. Mm. As I try to explain to my students, what if you're a young man with a growing family, mm. and you have to, you know, first of all, you want your children to go to school. What are the choices? Japanese schools. Right, run by the Japanese, and you want to get a good job, you work for a Japanese company. Mm. Is that collaborating? Surviving. It's surviving, it? exactly, yeah. exactly. And so a lot more people have collaborated, if you want to call it collaboration, um, than, um, than people want to admit. I have on my phone, by the way, a, um, an app. Yeah. It's a dictionary of collaborators. Oh, really? <laughs> Over 4,000 names on it of people who collaborated, supposedly. Yeah. I remember the previous government under uh, President Moon Jae-in was yeah. talking about uh, pulling out the deep-rooted evil, and, and there was that aspect oh, to yeah. it, and changing who had the designs on the coins and things right, like right, this. Right, and right, right, yeah, oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. it, it seems a, a very uh, unique approach, because, yeah. like you say, it was surviving, and yeah. th correct me if it, Kim Dae-jung was going to school at that time, wasn't yep. he? Yeah. He had a Japanese mm -hmm. name, and Samsung was around at that time, or was it Samsung yeah. came during colonization? Hyundai, I know Hyundai did. I know Hyundai did. It might be Hyundai that yeah, I'm thinking yeah. of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah it, no, it's Tinilpa is yeah. the local word they might call it. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine who teaches at Harvard, Carter Eckert, got in trouble writing a book about Kim Sung Soo, who's portrayed in South Korea as a great nationalist. Yeah. He was one of the first successful Korean businessmen. But Carter looked at Kim Sung Soo during the colonial period and said he could not have made the money he made if he hadn't worked with the Japanese. Mm -hmm. He had, had to have Japanese business partners. Yeah. He had to get money from Japanese-controlled banks. Korea didn't have any banks, by the way, until the Japanese created banks here. Mm -hmm. They didn't have that kind of a banking system because they didn't have a commercial economy. Um, but people were very upset that Carter had insulted Kim Sung-soo, but he was just, you know, Carter began his research, I know Carter quite well, he began his research thinking he was gonna prove what a strong nationalist Kim Sung-soo was during the colonial period, but the documents told him otherwise. Can mm -hmm. you tell me something about Carter, please, or Mr. Eck? Because I, I've read mm -hmm. his books, but oh. I, I, I can't picture him. I, right. I, I do. Well, yeah. uh, he's about my age, first of all. Yeah. He's been a, he was Peace Corps also, and he stayed yeah. in Korea for several years after that, yeah. working for Korean companies. And then he decided he'd gotten a master's in European history at Harvard before he went to Peace Corps and decided he wanted to do Korea. So he came to University of Washington and a little after me. Yeah. Uh, obviously very bright. Yeah. Um, he only works in 20th century. He doesn't deal with, with classical Chinese sources. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I admire about Carter is, again, a scholar who's willing to change his original assumptions when the evidence tells him he's wrong. Bravo. Some people won't do that, <laughs> and Carter did that. And he knew at the time it would cost him some friends in Korea, but he did it anyway. It's a brave man. Yeah, yeah. 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 Much yeah. respect for anybody that does that, whatever the results might be, because yeah. the, that, that's our job. Uh, tell me about the app. Can you say a little bit more about the app? Because you've just said well, that you have this app on your phone with 4,000 yeah. names. Is yeah. it a government app? Is it a private no, app? Do you no. Uh, it was done by a private group. The, uh, 
research center for collaborators. Yeah. Uh, and it's uh, by, by, you can look at people by their name yeah. or you go to a category. Those who collaborated in government, yeah. police, religious organizations, religious leaders, oh, wow. um, business people, educators, um, all kind of categories. Yeah. And uh, they give you a brief biography and why they call them collaborators. It doesn't really define what collaboration means is the problem. You know? I mean, you had to work with the Japanese. Mm. What can you do? You, um, and and through that, you you became you become shamed or tainted yeah, or something yeah. like that. Mm. Is there perhaps a necessity for that attitude? Because mm. South Korea is nation building, right? And it's got that question of legitimacy with the North and right, which one is right. the real Korea, and yeah. And so, is there kind of can we understand it in the sense of it's essential for nation building considering the situation, or is that? It could giving be giving them too much leniency. You no, know, I think especially when after 1945, Sigmund Rhee was a well-known nationalist, but many of the leading people in his government had gotten their original experience, whether in police or in administration, as with working with the Japanese. Mm. I mean, the Korean Army was first a bunch of former Jap. Park Chung Hee had been a Japanese yeah. Army officer. Carter Eckert wrote uh, that book, didn't he? Oh, yeah, yeah, with, yeah. The, with the front cover. <laughs> I love the cover. <laughs> the cover with Park Chung Hee, the Imperial Japanese uniform. Yeah, yeah I love that. It? I love yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, and so I think the Koreans had to compensate for the fact that, yeah. as the North Koreans were pointing out, hey, you got a lot of uh, pro Japanese figures in your government. They compensated by saying, oh, we hate them. You know, the, we, we're really against pro Japanese figures. And of course, those people are no longer in government, right? Mm. They, they all died, most of them. But then, nevertheless, I think there was a, a form of compensation um, for, to answer the North Korean uh, charges. You could never, when Park Chung-hee was in power, talk about his Japanese background. Mm, you could so never do that. Really? Yeah, yeah. Le- you'd go in trouble, legal trouble, if you oh, did that. Wow. Yeah, seriously. Wow. Yeah. Some of that, I think, still exists today in some things with defamation and what you can say about yeah. um, the comfort women situation or the Guangzhou yeah. situation. Yeah. I, I think we still feel and see that. And you work in these fields, though, don't you? I yeah, think. yeah. I mean, I get, when I first came to UBC in 1987, my students were primarily Korean Canadians. Mm. Now, uh, only about 25, 30 percent of my students have Korean ethnicity. Mm. Uh, but those students often, sometimes when I do modern history, they get upset about things that I, I teach. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't care about the earlier period. <laughs> I can say whatever I want about Joseon, they don't care. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in the modern period, they all have set opinions. I, I can't, they get upset if I talk about what we call colonial modernity. You can't deny that the Korean economy looked a lot more advanced in 1945 than it did in 1910. Mm-hmm. Now, it's true, the Japanese modernized the Korean economy to benefit Japan. Yeah. But in the process, Koreans got to work in factories. Mm. They got to manage some factories, some of them. They learned how to work with banks. You know, uh, They had an infrastructure, they had a railroad system. Korea had one of the best railroad systems in the world in 1945. Um, but I point that out, and some students get very upset. Right. You know. Right. Yeah. I think you're brave to point that out. Yeah. Well, we have to, you know, as historians, but uh, yeah. they don't like it. I'll tell you one little story about collaborators, by the way. Um, my third year at UBC, I still had a small class, about five students. Yeah. And one student was really good. Um, and after the term was over and turned in my grades, he came to my office, closed the door, and said, I want to tell you a secret. I said, what's your secret? He said, my great-grandfather, Iwan Yong, the leading trader in Korean history, the man who signed the annexation agreement in 1910. He said, don't tell anybody. Wow. <laughs> and he said, my great-grandfather did that to save the king's life. Oh, yeah. That was it. That was it. I was the, what the family story was. Because there were assassinations. I mean, that's right. Was, Queen Min was assassinated, right, wasn't right. she? And a nephew, yeah. they were after that. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah, there were attempts on Iwan Young, I think, too. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. You mentioned the uh, modernization of certain infrastructures, such as banks and trains. Yeah. Yeah. There was also, I mean, it, it, just while that box is open, there was the Xin uh, Song. And again, I, my, my research is, it, is not deep yeah. on this, but mm-hmm. this this idea of the, the new women. Women oh, yeah. were no longer kept inside the Anbangs or things like yeah. this, but they could wear Western clothes and right. exist in society. This was not for all women. But right. There was a there was a new path open right. for them. Yeah, I mean, Korean, Korean women by 1945 had much more opportunities for formal education, which mm. they hardly had at all in Joseon, mm. and also for jobs. Mm. You know, we have women physicians and so on. That wouldn't have happened in Joseon. Mm. And again, Korea would have probably have modernized on its own eventually. Yeah. But it probably would have been slower. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we we forget about the the massive changes that came about. And also, we also forget, there was no Korean language dictionary for Koreans until the colonial period. But, of course, the guys who compiled it were arrested by the Japanese <laughs> for compiling a Korean language dictionary in 1942. But uh, they had Chinese dictionaries. Yeah. But uh, it was under the Japanese that Koreans became more conscious of the importance of their language. Yeah. 
I mean, when did they start writing a lot in Hangul? In the end of the 19th century. Yeah. Of course, never being challenged by Japan in the West. Yeah. Uh, and I would argue, too, and this again gets my students upset, you don't really see modern nationalism in Korea until the colonial period. Think about it. In 1910, the Japanese took over Korea. There were not massive protests. Mm -hmm. Nine years later, the whole country erupts in 1919. Mm -hmm. In nine years, the Japanese had managed mm -hmm. to get the Koreans so angry mm -hmm. that they began to discover a common Korean identity. Whether they were elite, Yangban, or whether they were peasant, they were all being mistreated by the Japanese. we got to get together in this. Mm -hmm. That's not a nationalism. I mean, yeah. Koreans were loyal to the king before that. But nationalism, modern nationalism means the people together. And that really happens in the 20th century. I, yeah. I've read various books on this. I can't remember which way Andre Schmidt went on mm. Korea Between Empires, but right. I think it was similar. I read another more recent one, I think by a female author, who said that Korean nationalism began with the Japanese invasions in the 1500s and the righteous armies. And okay. I, I forget the book, uh, but, but I did read it. it. But it felt like a bit of a stretch at the time because I don't think it was nationalism as maybe we right. understood it, right. that everybody in the country identified yeah. as Korean. Yeah. Was that a book by Jai Hyun Kim Hamlish, was it? Yeah, that's the book. Yeah, she, exactly. Yeah, she's yeah, now passed away. You. She's a good friend of mine. Yeah. Uh, sad. She died of breast cancer. Um, she's a very good scholar. But I, Sorry I, for your I, loss. Yeah, I have problems with that book. Um, she, her argument really is that, you're right, she argues that the people rose up together. Actually, they're defending their local regions, what they were doing. Most of them were peasants forming a righteous army to defend their, their crop. Yeah. Um, but um, she also argues that in order to keep both the Japanese and the Chinese from reading messages from the by the king to his officials, he wrote in Hangul. Mm. And she says, that created a sense that we are separate people. Mm. We have our own written language. Mm -hmm. And they weren't using much Hangul. Hangul had been invented long before that, or a century before, but they weren't using it very much. Mm. And she argues and that that's the beginning of a Korean linguistic community. And one of the arguments for modern nationalism is that it appears when you have a, a common vernacular written language. Yeah. Yeah. And so she, yeah. she sees that. Again, I think that's an exaggeration. Mm -hmm. uh, that book, was, she was writing it when she died. And mm -hmm. so her, her, her students finished it off for her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was, yeah, thank you for reminding me of that book. I'm glad I, I got the main argument right. What's, um, I was going to ask you uh, about some good Korean studies books, like the book that you tell your students to read, or this is what <laughs> we must read. Um, can we go there? Because there was another question in my head that's just escaped. Like books that are reading, the ones that I always like Henderson's. Gregory Henderson. Yeah, I liked that one. It took me so long to get it, yeah. and I read it, and I was like, okay, this, 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 this. And that was one of the few things I read in grad school that was available in English. Yeah, yeah. and it's it, not available anymore. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you can see that Sold is a vortex that kind of sucks everything in. It's yeah. more now than when he wrote his book. I mean, yeah. over half the university students in Korea are in Seoul area, right? Yeah, and businesses are all here. Half the population's here. Yeah, mm. um, and the rural areas are being depopulated. Mm. Um, Insol, Tal Sol Malgo, Insol is the yeah, idea, yeah. 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 So, uh, so it's uh, that's a good book, but that's kind of it's kind of dated. I mean, yes. there's, um, there's so much good stuff out there. Uh, there's actually a very good modern history of Korea by two people who are not academics. It's called the Two Koreas, and the original author was a journalist, mm. and then he passed away. So Robert Carlin he used to work for a certain mm. unnamed government agency. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, He's very good, very good. He writes good novels about North Korea, by the way, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Inspector O novels. Uh, he cleaned it up and updated it, and it's very, very good, very mm -hmm. good. Yeah. Um, but I, I, now for a textbook, I like to assign my friend Eugene Park's book. Michael Seth has a good textbook of Korea. He calls it, he calls it a concise history of Korea. It's 900 pages. It's not very concise. <laughs> um, yeah. Seth does good work, actually. I've read a, a bit of his stuff, yeah. and I've thought that's quite interesting. And yeah, he does good, good work. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. But Gene Park just published his book called this History. This is a very new one, isn't it? it this came is out last this year. year. Yeah, yeah. Maybe last year. Yeah, okay. yeah, History of Korea. Yeah. And it's good. Gene's a good scholar. Yeah. He's a social historian, so you get a little more social history in there. Right. Uh, so I, I tried it last year, and students seemed to enjoy it. So mm -hmm. I've used Michael Seth before. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's. I, I recently wrote a piece in that... Um, I started with a story about Michael Harrod, who graduated from Leeds University in uh, maybe it was 87 or something in the United Kingdom, and he got offered a post to go and teach in Pyongyang. 
and oh. uh, in North Korea. And, and this didn't happen at the time. And so we approached the foreign office in England and said, can you tell me about North Korea? <laughs> and they replied, not really. Can you tell us about North Korea when you come back? <laughs> <laughs> and this, you know, this was this was the late 80s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't have to go far back to find there was not much on Korea at all. Yeah. And now, I mean, I've been reviewing books for NK News and it's hard to keep up. I try to read yeah. them all. I, I try to, but I it's know. it's just been this explosion going from there was nothing really right. about the country. Right, it was hard to get anything, yeah. and now it's just there everywhere. Yeah. Well, I discovered preparing for this lecture I gave yesterday on surveying uh, North American studies of Korean history. There's been an explosion of publications since around the year 2000. Mm -hmm. It's been quite incredible. I mean, there was a slow. Um, amount of publication before that, of course, but after 2000, in all kinds of fields. Yeah. You know, diplomatic history, uh, religious history, three books on Tonghak, for example, uh, which is amazing <laughs> to me. Uh, we're also, by the way, producing a lot of translations of books that were written in Chinese by Koreans in traditional times. Hawaii has a series called The Korean Classics Library. I just have a book published in that when I translate a early 19th century um, work by Chung Ha Gyeong, Ta San Chung Ha Gyeong. Uh, we had a guy in Australia who translated the Chungang Nok, if you know what that is. It's a book of um, no. fortune telling, but it, it's full of all kind of strange allusions. Like it makes no sense, but he yeah. translated it in a way that it makes no sense in the same way. <laughs> I don't know how he managed <laughs> Quite to do a that. Skill. Yeah. <laughs> but he needed over 2,000 footnotes to explain what the book says. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> really amazing work. Uh, so there's more material out in English. Now we can have our students read primary sources in English yeah. translation. Yeah. Um, what I end up usually doing is signing a lot of articles also. Mm -hmm. First of all, my students can download them to the library for free. Absolutely. Um, but, uh, and they get a wide variety of, um, of subjects that way. Uh, we, we have stuff on legal history. There's a woman in the University of Minnesota, I think it is, law school, who's written like three books on Korea's legal history, which is fascinating, um, including the colonial period and the late Chosun mm -hmm. and modern. Um, we have stuff on, on women in Korea. Yeah. We have, we have um, stuff on science and technology in Korea now. Um, and of course, we have politics and uh, social change and so on. So, there's an amazing wide variety. One book I like when I teach um, Joseon Dynasty, which I'll be doing this coming semester, I'll teach a course on just Joseon. Mm. Uh, it's not available electronically, so my students got to cough up some money. Mm. It's called Epistolary a, a Korea. Jahyun Habesh got together with some other scholars and they translated mm. a bunch of letters. Mm. And it's absolutely fascinating. Mm. One thing we discovered in the last couple of decades, we think, you know, Korean and Chosun, they were arranged marriages. They couldn't really love each other. Then we discovered often the surviving spouse, usually the husband would, because the wife often died in childbirth, would write a letter about how much he loved her and leave it in her tomb. And we found those letters from there. I guess they were having wow. to excavate tombs to build a new road or something. And we also found some from women when their husband died. And they really did love each other. And these are people who were... You know, obviously they're upper class; so they couldn't mm. write otherwise. Uh, but you know, they, the marriages were arranged by their families. Mm. They maybe, maybe, maybe didn't even meet each other until the day of their marriage. Mm. But they obviously loved each other, and it, uh, that kind of stuff gives you some insight into the daily lives of people in Chosun. Mm. And that's what epistolary Korea is so so good for. Um, because I've always that's fascinating. Because I've always understood that arranged my, Koreans have only been, and this is why I might be wrong, like sort of dating for love and doing that since about the sort of 60s or 70s that there was always this kind of arranged marriage yeah. and yeah. and this idea of love is not love but this idea of choosing your love this idea of saying i do this yeah. idea of having agency yeah. is a relatively new thing do you think these letters were part of ritual were they part of sort of it was a uh, something you had to do or no, this was a sign of affection i think it was a sign of affection yeah. read those letters they're a sign of affection by the way i've watched the korean dating culture change over the 50 uh, years I've been coming to Korea. Awesome. Uh, it, back when I first came, um, if you if you met somebody of the opposite sex you wanted to marry, yeah. you had to get the parents' approval. I knew people had to break off because the parents wouldn't approve. Mm -hmm. And you would see they call it sun phone and go match. What do you call that? Meet, a meeting with prospect of marriage. Mm -hmm. The young couple would be first in, in, in 70s. Often the parents would be talking with the young prospective bride and groom looking on, mm -hmm. and in the 80s you would find the prospective bride and groom talking while the parents looking on. <laughs> <laughs> then by the 90s, they're meeting just the two of them. You yeah, know? Yeah. So it was a slow transformation where people finally got the right to choose their own spouse. Um, 
And so again, like, like I, I, I'd assume that unless you chose your own spouse, there was no love there. But people did learn to love each other, even in arranged marriages. I, I think, um, you know, people like Bell Hooks and um, what's his name from? I can't remember his first name. The Art of Love. That love is a skill, and it's, um, mm. it's, it's a verb. It's not a feeling, but it's a skill that you develop over time. Yeah, and it yeah. takes hard work and effort. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, you, you have yeah. to master it over time. It's yeah. not easy. Not easy. You think yeah. love is going to come to you and it's yeah. going to strike you, but mm. you'd be waiting all your life, yeah. I think, sometimes yeah. for love like that. Yeah. There's an interesting episode from a, a diary that Kim Sun Jew at Harvard translated, yeah. a 16th century diary, a young man guy. And one point he's up in Seoul and his wife's in the countryside and he writes to her, he says, uh, I'm really proud of myself. I haven't slept with another woman up here. She goes, oh, you're really proud of that, are you? <laughs> Well done. I mean, you, you should give yourself a little pat on the back. I don't, I, why not? You know, because the alternative is very different. Yeah. I, 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 you, you talked about meeting parents and things like that. Yeah. And so, so I got married. I, I just share my little story very briefly about that. But I had to, my wife's family is from Busan. They're quite conservative. Mm. And, uh, she liked me because I don't have any tattoos. If I had tattoos, that you know, I'd, I had long hair and piercings, but I, I've been tattoo free. And uh, before we got married, I was not allowed in the family home. Oh yeah. And after we got married, I could put my feet up and ask for drinks, and oh, yeah. you know, I could act yeah. like I was yeah. uh, king of the land. Well, I yeah. didn't because I yeah. still show deference, but yeah. I wasn't allowed inside. Was well. Like, <laughs> When I was first dating the woman who's now my wife, yeah. uh, she wanted me to meet her father. I said, wait a minute. I haven't really <laughs> just made up my mind yet. <laughs> <laughs> so cause that's pretty when you, Back then, when you meet the parents, that, that's yeah, pretty serious. That's, that, yeah. that's a big thing. <laughs> um, let's just round off this Korean studies thing, because as I was doing some reading, this, this might be even more sensitive than colonization and, and China. Korean studies as a field and the... Mm. The factions, the competitiveness. I, I never knew that academia was like this, but I, <laughs> I've had scholars come after me and threat and violence. Oh, it's and horrible. Yeah. It, it, it's horrible. And I, I've, seen, um, I've seen bits between you and Professor Myers. There's been some oh, yeah. bits going around. Oh, yeah. There's the whole yeah. Armstrong thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Brian talks about like the, the Cummings faction. <laughs> and it's almost like you get sort of, um, yeah. <clears throat> you know, communist I factions know. here and yeah, there, like yeah, the, the Kim Il-sung. Can you p- perhaps just say something, because you've been in it for so long, Don. Yeah. Can you give us a view of the Korean studies field? Are there groups or is it, or is it just a big ball of love? No, not. <laughs> I mean, scholars are all about arguing with each other. Yeah, and, yes, yeah, yes. Usually we're willing to say, okay, you, you looked at a little different data, so you came to a different conclusion. Other times we say, how could you ever possibly reach that conclusion with that data? Yeah, you know? uh, especially if it contradicts what we've come to believe. Yeah. Um, now I'm not. I, I'm, I've been friends with Bruce Cummings for a long time. I wouldn't call myself a member of the Cummings faction. Okay, uh, yeah. but uh, but I am a, a, a proud member of the James Palais Mafia. We used to call it. <laughs> he didn't like the term, by the <laughs> way. That's but. a good name, though. That sounds all <laughs> yeah, right. He, did, <laughs> he, he didn't like that. Uh, but uh, no, I mean there are those of us who are, who are good friends. I'm good friends with Mark. Peterson is now famous for his uh, frog outside the well. Yeah, um, and, um, and John Duggan just retired from UCLA. He's an old friend. We were in grad school together. Uh, I, I'm trying to think. Of, uh, I would say that China and feel and Japan feel have, have more factionalized because they're larger. First of all, mm-hmm. um, there's a little bit of we Choson dynasty historians say we can do Choson and modern, but you guys are stuck in the 20th century because you don't read Chinese. <laughs> a little bit of that. How, how, how do you get on reading Chinese? Do you? Of course, uh, It's yeah. a stupid question, but yeah, can you tell me about reading that? Because my Korean teacher is David, your hand needs to improve, and so yeah. I'm getting it all the time. Okay. But. Well, I studied Chinese before I learned Korean, first of all. Oh. Uh, because learning Chinese character is not the same as reading Hanwen. I mean, yeah. Hanwen is different grammar. Um, it takes a while because traditional texts have no punctuation. Mm. But the grammar is pretty simple. Mm-hmm. And once you realize instead of punctuation, they have kind of a, a break mm-hmm. where you know you're supposed to catch your breath. Ah, that's a new sentence. <laughs> and there are little, they call them empty particles in Chinese. They don't have any meaning, but they indicate something about. Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah, kind of, kind of. <laughs> you know, but and more Sorry. like, oh, yeah, and thing, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. And so, you know, a, a thought is coming to an end. Um, the difficult thing about Chinese is, that, especially when you're trying to translate it into English, mm-hmm is, first of all, it's very concise. And secondly, when they're, especially when philosophers or poets are writing, they assume their readers have memorized basically 2,000, 3,000 years of Chinese text. And so they'll say something, they'll give you like two or three syllables, and you're supposed to recognize where it came from. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
And fortunately, there's a a program I, uh, of of uh, my library subscribes to. I'm able to go in there and say, okay, where did this come from? And usually, you can tell me, yeah, because uh, I have no clue. You know, I, I haven't memorized the text, so that's difficult. Um, but basically, it, it just takes a lot of time. Um, I mean, you need to be able to read classical Chinese. You probably need three to four thousand characters that you know, and um, and you got to remember things like the, the the character used in modern Chinese for the verb to be means this in classical. Mm. Doesn't mean a verb. Mm. Uh, little things like that that throw you off. Um, but you know, it's 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 in a way it's easier than learning Korean. You don't have to worry about a native speaker saying you're wrong <laughs> <laughs> because there is no no native speakers of classical Chinese. Yeah. And, and, and Korean and Chinese people or Joseon and Chinese people communicate by writing things down and That's sending right. because the pronunciation was so different. Right, right. right. They, yeah. they call it uh, pen talk. Pen talk, yeah. brush talk, actually. Brush talk. Yeah. Steve Shields um, mm, yeah. sent me a message. He was he was on this uh, recently, but he sent me a message the other day saying, David, please do something on the diminishing use of Chinese characters of yeah. Hanja yeah. in Korean and get some young people on and let's hear what they say because <clears throat> he used to read old newspapers and I guess he has a, a certain knowledge of it, although I'm not sure, but he, he sees it perhaps as a, as a sad thing. Yeah, I think so too. I think so too. Um, again, I'm biased, but it, there was a, a Korean Canadian professor of education who studied the ability of Koreans who know Chinese to read a text versus those who didn't. And if you know Chinese, you can read a lot faster. It was, it was a mixed script. Okay. Um, especially for headlines and things in newspapers, much easier. Yeah. 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 But I, believe it or not, I actually see some young Korean historians working in the Joseon Dynasty who are reading their, their footnotes are the sources that have been translated into Korean. And you can't trust the translation. I mean, even if it's accurate, it changes the nuances, you know. And I hate to see that because you got to read the original. Um, and it, it is kind of sad. Um, you know, it's part of the, first of all by not reading Chinese, they're cutting themselves off from most of their history. You know. Um, I mean, is there a nationalist thing going on there? Is that yeah, no? I'm yeah. Korean. We'll do it in yeah. Korean. And I remind yeah. them that we use. Um, Arabic numerals. <laughs> we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not a problem, right? Yeah. Uh, and we use Latin words all the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but yeah, there's a nationalistic thing. You got to get away from that Chinese. There was a lot more Chinese being used in the 1970s when I came mm -hmm. here. I promise mm -hmm. you. Most shops were named had names in Chinese. Mm -hmm. uh, occasionally with English translations. Like my favorite was a barber shop that had an English head cutting. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that in a Korean barber shop though. You can, yeah. They, they would have that. And I, I just want to say like full respect for you, not but, but just for the Chinese alone, I think, mm -hmm. let alone the Korean, but, but having that as, you know, as a, as a Southern American boy, does that give you a sense of pride that you can navigate both modern Korea and Joseon because you have that linguistic knowledge. That's it, it, an incredible thing. Yeah, I look down on 20th century historians. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. no it, it does, of course, in my department of Asian studies, there's a lot of us who, who use Chinese. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. And one of my colleagues is Japanese studies, but he reads like handwritten Chinese on, po on poems, on paintings. Mm. And I have real trouble with handwritten Chinese, I can mm. promise you that. It's really diff I have an official dictionary for that, but it's still it's difficult. Uh, I, I I prefer the, the clear printed form. <laughs> you can probably get an app that you can put your phone on right, right. and it will read it for you now. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Yeah. You can probably get one. Um, you come back, slowly we're coming back to Guangzhou. Okay. We're, we're taking a little bit of a meander. <laughs> okay. um, but you come back here to do some research, right? And you were researching... Yeah. Um, you were researching the persecution of Catholics in the 18th century. Uh, I was going up to 1791, yeah. uh, which is the first killing of Catholics for being Catholics. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. I was trying to figure out why'd you do that. I mean, well, I was puzzled about two things. First of all, yeah. why did some Koreans become Catholics before there were missionaries here? Mm. And missionaries didn't arrive here. Well, a Chinese priest was brought in in, in uh, 1794, but no, no French priest until the 1830s. Um, but also. Um, I wanted to understand how Confucians responded to this totally different philosophy. Because even before Catholicism was adopted as a religion, Koreans were reading books published in China, brought back to Korea, that presented in Chinese the basic assumptions of medieval European philosophy. I said, how could they possibly understand that stuff? You know, And some of them did and criticized it. And so to me, if I want to understand Confucianism, the best way to do it 
is not to look at Confucians talking among themselves, where they don't have to articulate their unexamined assumptions, but when they're looking at something so totally different, they've got to say, this is what I believe, and they're wrong. <laughs> That's amazing, because I've spent so long trying to look at Korea, and I have been, and then suddenly I started reading books about other countries, and then I was like, oh, wow. I'm understanding Korea <laughs> yeah. by reading things about right. Japan and China right. and going away from it. Right. That you right. get that comparative right. lens. Yeah. Um, what's the incompatibility between Confucianism and Catholicism? Is it the is it the ancestor worship? Is it the one God? Or? That, that's more of a, a symptom than a cause of incompatibility. Okay. I would say I have a book called Korean Spirituality, mm -hmm. and I argue that there are two kinds of religions in Korea. Theocentric, God-centered, and anthropocentric, human-centered. Mm -mm. Confucianism is all about being, getting along with your fellow human beings, and yeah. Christianity is about obeying God's laws. And when um, the first Catholics were being interrogated, the interrogators would say, let me hear your Ten Commandments. Okay, they'd tell them, where's the commandment to obey your king? <laughs> <laughs> and what's this God business doing in there? You yeah, know? Yeah. Uh, and, so that's the, they, and ancestor worship, um, the problem was that it wasn't so much that they well they, they destroyed the spirit tablet on which the name of the ancestors is written, and that was a violation of the of the laws. But the problem was the king had told the young man, the elite, they had to worship their ancestors that way, and and the Catholics were saying, but my God, through the Pope, says I can't, and I said, how can you listen to this invisible God and ignore your king? You know, mm. so that was the real conflict that uh, the Koreans believed there was a higher power, mm. and the, for the Confucians, the higher power still got to be human. Mm. Yeah, and so uh, anthropocentric versus theocentric is what I, way I see it. Also, they also saw Catholicism as selfish because Catholics want to be good to go to heaven themselves. Yes, and Confucian said, "What about your family?" Right, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, they're really incompatible assumptions. Can yeah. you say something about ancestor worship? Did you see any in the seventies? Of course, yeah, yeah. Because I, I've taken part in ancestor worship, and I've seen one. It's while it's taking place, I've seen um. Christians stand outside the room right, right, and right, they right, won't right. even witness it. And right, some right. of the first one that I attended, uh, the men sat in the living room and got drunk and the women were in the kitchen and they <laughs> oh, yeah, ate there. Yeah, and it, yeah, it too. You can't really sort of talk about that today, but they were some of my first experiences and yeah. it was only the men sit down here right. and, and, and the women were there. That's since changed. Yeah, it has but, changed, um, yeah. yeah. Sometimes when I was asking about the, uh, the layout of the food and the colors and the th yeah. things like this, I kind of felt felt that they were just kind of making it up. No, like, are, this the, feels this feels right to us. So I was like, why is this there? Why is this there? And it's like, no, it's just it goes from this color to that color. Yeah, the, there's a guide. <clears throat> the guide came out of China, but they modified it for Korea. Yeah. You'll notice they never offer um, uh, what is it? You, you never put offer, offer even soju mm. uh, to the ancestors because soju is a foreign drink. It was a, they got it from the Mongols. Mm. <laughs> it's got to be makgeolli rice wine. Always rice wine. Yeah, it wasn't soju. It was. It was more of a. It would look like pexedu or something like that that we used. Okay, it has to be rice wine. Yeah, right. yeah, we, we did yeah, it wrong then. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't like the term ancestor worship, by okay. the way, because that's, that's how the Catholics condemned it. I call it ancestor memorial service because, as you know, uh, you know, bowing is the way you show respect and worshiping. You bow to friends, right? Mm. To uh, to your elders, your yeah, bosses. I'm about to uh, you. But but the uh, <laughs> the the Pope in Rome said, bowing to the tablet must be worship. Therefore, it's idolatry. Idolatry, yeah. yeah. Now, Catholics in the 1930s were told, oops, all those people who died, sorry, it's not wrong to do ancestor worship. <laughs> mm. But Protestants still are very much against it. Uh, Can you perhaps just say something about what actually happens? Because the, mm -hmm. I, I've seen it, and, and you've seen it, and I'm very curious about 1970s, whether it was different, but from what I've seen, People will lay out a table. Right. There'll be a, a wipe. Is that the, they'll yeah. write the uh, yeah. the names on them. When right. I saw those, and I saw, wow, that ancestor had two wives, and I was seeing <laughs> this kind of thing. <laughs> it was it was yeah. very not modern, you know. Yeah. It was yeah. very different. Yeah. And um, there would be they would you would pour something in a bowl, and then there would be three pours, and then you right. would yeah. circle it round right. clockwise right. three yeah. times and pour yeah. it, and then lights would go off and the. The patriarch would clear his throat and <clears throat> yeah. and speak to the spirits. Right. There was a certain amount of bowing, and the men and women bowed different amounts of times, right. and the hand had to go over the left or the right. right. Can you perhaps talk? This well, is my. I'm trying to lay actually what it is like out. Yeah. Well, the Koreans in the early Joseon Dynasty got a book from China written by Zhu Xi, the founder of New Confucianism. It's called The Guide to Family Rituals. Okay. And it's quite detailed in there. Yeah. And that's why they do all that. 
Uh, that's you, all in there, the hand direction and which way so. over. Green, okay. Green Bay added a few things, just, but basically they want to follow that. Yeah. Uh, and one thing you, you, you probably remember, uh, you have all the food on the table. Yeah. You, you do all this bowing and speaking to the ancestors. Then yeah. you leave yeah. and close the door. Then you come back. you got to give the ancestors time to enjoy the food. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. But then they only take the spiritual substance. So you get to enjoy the rest. <laughs> <laughs> and you do it. And you yeah, sit yeah. and you eat it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. And that's why if you come to Korea, you're not meant to put your chopsticks vertically in right, rice. Right, 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 right. Because that's what you do for the ancestors that have passed. That's right, yeah. And there's chesar and there's chale. Yeah, yeah. Slightly yeah. different, aren't yeah, they? yeah, yeah. 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 They seem to have been diminishing. I think people now just, uh, they go to Japan on holiday when it right, comes to right. Chuseok, yeah. I yeah, I've, seen, I've seen surveys on definitely diminishing. But still, Korea does more of that than, uh, even more than Taiwan, because Taiwan, most of the people lost their ancestral line when they moved to Taiwan from the mainland. Mm. Uh, and more than in Singapore, apparently. Mm. But again, most of those people there are immigrants of the last 150 years, so they don't have those ancestral ties. But as you know, Koreans are very much aware of ancestors several centuries into the past. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And you got to keep those traditions going. But then you had the problem that the eldest son immigrates to America. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. what do you do then? Yeah. Or the eldest son becomes a Christian and doesn't right. want to do it. Or, or the eldest son marries a woman who's a Christian. Right. I, that, oh, I've seen that play out. Oh, that's I, that's, seen, a, that's family drama. She won't prepare the food. <laughs> yeah. No, I've seen, yeah. I've seen these situations taking place. And in general, you know, Koreans, this religion, yeah. who you marry, is, is quite a thing. Yeah. Well, yeah. Actually, it was Christianity that introduced the notion of religious exclusivity. The early Protestant missionaries said a, a Korean has no problem being um, a, a Buddhist in the morning, a Confucian in the afternoon, and a shamanist in the evening. Yeah. You know, they didn't see any problems with that. But Catholicism first in the late 18th century, and then the Protestants coming in the late 19th century said, you only have one religion. That's it. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and that's, um, that's what's caused this problem. Mm. Yeah. And, and it's nice to mix and match sometimes. I it's nice so. to read about all the different things oh, yeah. and go yeah. to the different ceremonies and oh, yeah. you know, go to a temple in the morning and go to their the yeah, mosque yeah, at night yeah. and go yeah. and see what they're doing. Yeah. And they sing yeah. the songs and eat the food. Right, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> they got some nice food sometimes, these places. Um, <coughs> you come back to Korea to write on the persecution of Catholics. Right. And you're here in 79? Yes, I am. Yeah. And so 79 is the assassination of Park Chung-hee. That's right. I... Uh, I was a Fulbright scholar, so I got a call from the American embassy the next oh, morning no. saying, the president has been incapacitated. <laughs> That's what he said. That's now, an we, understatement. Yeah, yeah. We knew something was going on. Uh, I'm not, I wasn't an activist then, but I was in contact with people who were, uh, Westerners primarily, and something was very strange. The, the head of the, the Korean CIA, Kim Jae-gyu, was meeting with activists and saying, Look, there have been some arrests lately, but I'm, I wasn't responsible for that, and I'm trying to keep them from being tortured. We said, what's going on? Tell me about these Western activists. Don, who well, they were many missionaries. Oh, missionaries, okay. They were missionary types, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, and it was just very strange. You know, well, We couldn't figure out what was happening, and then um, there were some demonstrations in, I think it was in Masan, mm-hmm. um, before Park was assassinated, and then we suddenly saw these posters on the walls of the pedestrian... Un- underpasses, mm. telling us about people being killed there. The newspapers couldn't report it. Mm. Turned out later, Kim Jae-gyu had ordered the KCIA to put those posters up. Mm. And we were going, what is going on? <laughs> we couldn't figure it out. And of course, he was assassinated by Kim Jae-gyu, who we now know wanted to go down in history as a man who restored democracy in Korea. Mm. That's what he was trying to do. Of course, it didn't work, but that's what he tried I, to do. I missed the bit about the posters. So the posters, sorry. The po- there, there were these Big character posters yeah. on the walls of the un, like Guangham under yeah, under yeah, and they would say so many people were killed yeah. when they demonstrated in Masan. Okay, yeah, it was small numbers, but still. And 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 these were put up on the on the order of Kim Jae-gyu. That's what we were told. That's what you were told. Yeah, I I, I don't have any documents to prove that. Right, right, yeah, right. Yeah. But that, that, that's what people were telling me. Yeah. Did it feel? strange coming up like under the Yushin under that was it scary I mean to, was, to yeah. walk back into that or to yeah. come back into that environment yeah. must have been yeah well I was here when Yushin was declared in yeah. 72 um, and I saw a lot of people really angry about it mm. uh, I knew people who were arrested mm. uh, who'd go to prison could walk into prison had to be carried out because of the torture they oh. suffered um, and it, it, it but again we came, coming back in 79 there was a feeling of tension in the air in Seoul I was in Seoul then not Gwangju and um, some friends of mine who had been in Peace Corps with me and gone back to Seattle 
remember that I wrote them a, a letter early October 79 saying something big is going to happen soon. Mm-hmm. And they got the letter after Fox assassination. Oh, <laughs> they wow. figured I was a prophet. Uh, you could just feel the tension. We knew something was going to happen. The, the economy was tanking. Mm-hmm. And, and Falk got his legitimacy from the growing economy. Right. Uh, and we're getting these signs that Kim Jae-gyu seemed to be trying to position himself for something. We couldn't figure out what it was. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we didn't expect assassination. I didn't anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a real shock. Uh, but it, we, we, there was definitely tension in the air. Yeah. People happy when he went? Were people crying when people he went? Crying. People, people were crying. People crying. Yeah. Because he was the man who, who brought Korea out of poverty. Mm-hmm. I mean, he wasn't as rich as he is now, but he started the process. Mm-hmm. Just like when Sigmund Rhee was overthrown in 1960. People overthrew him and then cried and <laughs> thought of him as he was leaving. You know, it's... <laughs> I did it. <laughs> yeah, they did. They did. Yeah. And Landa Rose, he was going to the airport to fly to Hawaii and they were crying and waving goodbye. <laughs> you know? That's 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 a lot of kind of... I, I forget the, what they might call it, like the jong, but I love you and I hate you at the same time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, you know, yeah. it's that affection. You've spent that long yeah, with each yeah, other. Yeah. In in the course of history, should Park chung be remembered as somebody... <sighs> Oh, I didn't know that that was a sensitive question, but I tried to say that this is a man that uh, he, he had some tactics that we should not, you know, uh, right. condone or mm-hmm. or support in any way. But he's he wasn't Kim Il Sung, right? He right, wasn't. He, he wasn't putting gulags and there, and he, it seemed like he was trying to build the nation rather than build himself. Yeah, he, as he, I understand, he that. was not corrupt like Chun Doo Yeah. 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 Um, when I teach modern history, I have trouble teaching about Park Chung-hee because students want a clear answer. Was he good for Korea or bad? Oh, I say sure. he was bad politically but good economically. That's, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, and he was, I'm convinced that you know, Park Chung-hee was a communist in his youth. His brother was, ex- was killed as a communist. Um, but he, the Korean War changed his mind on that, obviously. And he, he realized, because he was in intelligence before he became uh, president, he realized that North Korea at that point was doing better than South Korea economically, and he realized that economic power can equal military power. Mm. So he was determined to build up the South Korean economy and surpass North Korea, which he did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and again, he wasn't doing it to enrich himself. He really right. wasn't. He, but the trouble is he really came to believe that he was the only man who knew what was right. Even his nephew-in-law, Kim Jong-il, was not quite right, even mm. though Kim Jong-il helped put him in power. Mm. Uh, he was the man who knew everything. And if you listen to him, you're out. That was the problem. Uh, but again, he was dedicated to the country. I don't deny that. And not personally corrupt at all. Um, Do you have any experience with Kim Jong-pil, the kingmaker? He's somebody that seems to be so important, <laughs> but very few people have a story about I, him. I never met him, no. Mm. I, I saw him once waving with his uh, white gloves on his hand, waving out of a <laughs> limousine. He was approaching. Uh, they got white gloves here, don't they? I know. I know. Uh, big black limousine with the white gloves. But uh, he was an amazing man, really a survivor. Yes. I mean, he was in politics forever. <laughs> is there a book on him? Uh, in, not in English, no. In Korean, yeah. There, yeah. Been, yeah but not. In, well, there has been. A, there was a series of um, interviews with him that gave his life story. They came out, I think, in the, either the Korea Times or the Korea Herald. Mm. Uh, I, I don't know if it's been compiled to a book or not. In there, he talks about the fact that both he and Park Chung Hee were, were members of the South Korean Workers' Party in 1946. Mm-hmm. Interesting, he admitted that. Yeah. Can we open that? Since we're talking about communism yeah. and South Korean communists, yeah. Gwangju. Yes, okay. Uh, uh, you understand why I'm asking this yeah, question? I know. Uh, is, there, is, is Gwangju the place of the, the South Korean left? Is it a communist left or is it a different left? I ask respectfully. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I've run into this. I've walked down Guangham on, um, mm. on, on Saturday recently and saw people saying there was all 600 North Korean soldiers in Guangzhou. First of all, of all the bodies that were found, hundreds of them, not a single one was a non-South Korean. Right. Okay. Um, people tell me they didn't hear any North Korean accents. Mm. They heard Kyung Sang-do accents, which they didn't like, but they didn't hear North Korean accents. And we do know that um, when the army was forced out of the city on May 21st, forced to retreat to the outskirts of the city, and the city was free until May 27th, um, they would hold rallies every day around noon in the square, Rotary, in front of what was in the provincial capital building. Mm -hmm. And almost anybody could talk. And one middle-aged lady got up and gave a very radical speech. And I wasn't there then. People told me later. They heard her, and they thought, she's a... really radical. She must be a communist. They grabbed her and turned her over to the army. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. um, one important thing to remember about Kwang Ju, people forget this. Mm-hmm. The first violence was committed by the troops, not the people. Mm-hmm. The people didn't pick up guns and begin shooting back until the evening of May 21st after the army had shot into a crowd of 50,000 unarmed civilians. Mm-hmm. 
shooting from the ground, from snipers on rooftops, and from helicopters. That's when they got weapons. Before that, they were throwing rocks, okay? But they weren't using weapons. Uh, the army began killing people with clubs, well, wounding with clubs on the 18th, killing people with clubs on the 19th, began shooting either the late 19th or the 20th. Um, and so the army started the violence. So you want to say that North Koreans instigated the violence. I have to explain why the violence began with the South Korean military. Mm-hmm. And I want to make a big distinction between the special forces and the regular army. Mm-hmm. The regular army tried to stop it. Mm-hmm. The special forces were told there were North Korean agents there. I don't blame them either. I blame their superiors who lied to them. They really believed they were fighting North Koreans, uh, which is why they were so cruel. Uh, and the regular army, which is based outside of Gwangju, tried to come in and, and, and stop the... Not overthrow Chun because he had deceased power through a coup, but stopped the excessive violence, and they were unsuccessful. And, and the general was busted to private. Yeah. Can we perhaps just backtrack a little bit mm. and say how did the shooting come about, and and who was it? Because we've jumped sort of yeah. right into okay. Oil Pal, okay, uh, yes, yes, eighteenth of May, right? And uh, I think there might be some people that don't know. What right. was happening, and okay. um, why were the people outside? If you see what I mean, yeah, yeah. Yes. 101 okay. on Guangzhou. Yeah, on, on May 17th, Chen Duan seized control of the government. Yeah. He dissolved parliament, arrested about 800 politicians, about 800 journalists, 800 professors. We wouldn't like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, and so basically, the country was under nationwide martial law. Um, students throughout the country had said, expected it to happen, and they had said they would meet at 10 o'clock in the morning in front of their campus gates to protest. Um, the only place they did that was Kwangju, probably because the government was more successful than the rest of the country in arresting student leaders on the 17th. Mm. Um, and so about 200 students showed up at the front gates of Chennam National University at 10 o'clock in the morning on Sunday, May 18th. And they saw these soldiers there. And they expected what had been previously, which are riot police using tear gas. Mm. And so they shouted, you know, release Kim Dae-jung, who'd been arrested the night before, uh, give us free elections, and so on. And the commander of the troops said, you have three minutes to disperse. And they expected, again, tear gas. It wasn't. It was clubs. Um, I don't mean sticks. I mean serious clubs. Mm. Enough of them escaped and ran downtown. There's a walking street in Kwangju on weekends where they shut down car traffic and young men and women put on their best clothes and try to attract members of the opposite sex. Um, they were walking down that street, and suddenly they see these students saying, they're killing us. And nobody believed them until they saw the soldiers chasing them. Mm-hmm. And so it was the anger of the people in Kwangju who started throwing rocks at these soldiers. And the soldiers would club people in unconsciousness when they caught them. Um, and they, they had little skirmishes throughout the day on the 18th. On the 19th, people came downtown to see what was going on. The soldiers showed up again, and people shouted at them, and the soldiers attacked them uh, with clubs again. Uh, they began, the first person to die that we know of is a deaf man who couldn't hear the command to stop. Mm. He'd gone to the bus station to say goodbye to his brother mm. on the 19th and came back and they said, stop, and he didn't hear us, so they beat him to death. Mm. Um, by the 20th, uh, I'm told that some people were getting Molotov cocktails at the point, but still no weapons, no guns. Um, this is the, the, the demonstrators. That right, the demonstrators, you know, Molotov cocktails. Uh, and, and they're mm. asking for mm. Chanduan to step down, they're asking for democracy, the release of Kim dae Right. all of those things, or right. one of those things? <laughs> a slogan became, I'm not sure yeah. earlier became, a slogan was, rip Chun Doo-hwan's head off. <laughs> <laughs> they were pretty angry. Yeah. Uh, I mean, some of the deaths, the soldiers were, let me tell you one story that I thought was a rumor for a long time until over the summer I read the first person account. Mm. There was a, a young couple, the man was a high school teacher, his wife was, they had a three-year-old child, his wife was eight months pregnant. They lived near Chennai University. On the 19th, they heard a commotion down the street, so he went out to see what was going on. He didn't come back, so she went looking for him. He came back, and his wife's body was in the street. Couldn't even recognize her face. It was an um, automatic weapon had blown her face off. Um, I'm assuming the soldier just saw somebody move out of the corner of his eye and shot without thinking. And I can't imagine he deliberately shot a woman eight months pregnant. But that's what it was like. There were children never killed that way. And you can imagine the anger in the people in Guangzhou. And finally on May 21st, 50,000 people gathered uh, in front of the provincial capital building, which was kind of the base for the, for the special forces. And um, they were saying, chanting, go home, go home. Now, they had some buses among them, and the soldiers were worried about those buses that might run over them. Um, what I've learned now is that um, the, 
first of all, they started playing the national anthem at one o'clock, and the crowd started singing the national anthem. But then, for some reason, one of the special forces armored trucks backed up and ran over two soldiers of its own, and people thought the soldiers fell because they'd been shot by the demonstrators. Mm-hmm. So they started firing into the crowd mm-hmm. for ten minutes. Mm-hmm. Now. The good news is only about 70 or 80 people were killed that day, and about another 350 wounded, which tells me most of the soldiers were firing into the air, not into the – otherwise you would have killed a lot more. There were 50,000 people. Firing into a crowd of 50,000 so people. So they must have been firing above their head. It would have killed more than 70 or 80. Yeah. Still the graphics of that don't seem uh, to make sense to me. Do you know, in, in the yeah. Korean context, to have soldiers to do that is, yeah. is – well, they, unfathomable. Well, uh, first of all, the soldiers were told they were fighting communists. Right. Uh, yeah. And people had been throwing rocks at them. And uh, trucks and taxis were being used to force them off the street. Mm. Uh, and they were angry about that. But they did stuff that's... I, I read a book, um, the first person accounts by medical personnel at the time. Uh, it turns out as the soldiers were retreating, they drove past Chennam University Hospital and they shot into the hospital. Some of the bullets went into the operating room. Mm. I don't think they deliberately meant to do that. Mm. Maybe they thought some of the demonstrators would take a shelter in the hospital or something. I don't know. Mm. But, I mean, they they were not well controlled. Um, and the rumors were, of course, that they'd been giving soju. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but they, did, they were told they were fighting North Korean agents. And they couldn't understand that the whole population now was rising up against them. Mm. And and during the, we call it free Kwangju, between um, the evening of, May 21st until the morning, early morning on May 27th, mm. the city was free. And um, the, it, in spite of what the newspapers were saying in Seoul, I found out what was going on to shortwave radio. Mm. Um, the, the city was practically crime-free. Mm. People were giving food to what we call the citizens' militia, the young men, who were not students, most of them. They were young men, Shishan boys, people like that, who'd grab weapons from reserve army arsenals. They were giving them food. Uh, no banks were robbed. There'd been a couple of buildings burnt before that. A, t- a tax office was burned, and also NBC Broadcasting because they were broadcasting the government line. People were angry. After that, there was no more property destruction. Um, and uh, they had, at one point, there were 5,000 weapons in the hands of Kwangju citizens, and some religious leaders, primarily Catholic priests, but some progressive Protestant pastors, were able to r- connect to, with those people with the guns and get 4,500 rifles returned. Wow. Uh, which they kept in the venture capital building, which had become the headquarters for the resistance. Uh, and they were trying to negotiate with the military a peaceful solution, but the military said no way. And they came in early in the morning, 3.30 in the morning on May 27th. Um, the killings weren't as bad as we thought. Uh, we expected a massacre. They basically killed people who shot at them. Well, some innocent people were killed who had gotten in the way. Um, we still don't know if any, any people were killed in a park um, across the river from downtown Kwangju into the Christian Hospital called Kwangju Park. There were shots heard there. We don't know if anybody was killed there. People were killed in front of the, inside the YWCA. I saw the fresh blood. And of course, people were killed in the Capitol building, Venture Capitol building. Um, but basically, the sit- average citizen in Kwangju was um, was not fired at. Uh, there was one young man who had volunteered to safeguard those rifles that he was shot because the army thought he was part of the demonstrators. Uh, things that I saw, I'll never forget. Um, there's a, a judo hall across from the venture capital building called Sang Mugwan, and they were grabbing bodies off the street, unidentified bodies, and bringing them there to be identified. I saw a long line of grandmothers dressed in white d- waiting to go in there to see if their grandchildren's bodies were inside. Never forget that. Never. Mm-hmm. Um, another case, I was wandering around, and I saw there was a... a wooden box, a coffin, on the mm-hmm. back of a bicycle. Mm-hmm. And the guy was carrying it out of town, and the mother was running after it saying, don't leave me, son. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's, everybody who was there mm-hmm. knows the truth. Uh, people who weren't there, it's got hard to believe that your own army would do that to you. But I repeat, it was special forces who'd been brainwashed, not a regular army, but it's still hard to believe that would really happen. Um, and also, because people, Kwangju was portrayed in the media as it was a communist rebellion, or even the American embassy was calling them rioters. And I told the ambassador, the troops were rioting, not the people. You know, um, 
But it's been very hard to get people to accept what happened. It's better, much better now. Now they have an official cemetery, an official yeah. day of mourning on May 18th, and good movies have come out about it. Even the conservative president goes down there. I know. I'm I surprised. saw President yeah. Yoon went yeah. down there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can tell you when um, when Park Geun Hye was impeached and Moon Jae in became president, mm. um, he. When Park Geun Hye and Lee Min Bak before her were president, they wouldn't allow people to sing at the annual memorial service this song, "March of the Beloved." It's kind of mm. an anthem of, of Gwangju. Uh, Moon Jae In becomes president. He goes to Gwangju that May, mm. and he sings with the people. And mm. I went there that June. I could see the difference in their mood. Mm. Is that he's not from here, and he accepts us. Yeah, <laughs> you know? it's important. Yeah. Can we just talk a little bit about Free Gwangju? Yeah. So, you know, this is the. The, the city run by the people. Can, right. can you just explain Free Gwangju a little bit? 21st to the 27th. Free, what's Free Gwangju in Korea? Is it Jai Yunin Gwangju? Or Hebang Gwangju? Gwangju. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gwangju. Liberated Gwangju. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The army still surrounded the city. Yeah. Okay. Um, and there were still occasional skirmishes and helicopters still flew overhead. Uh, but basically, the city was, it's kind of hard to say self governing because you didn't really have a structure. Uh, there was an attempt at first of a bunch of elder citizens to form a, they call it a settlement committee. Mm. Uh, but people got mad at them because they said, we have to first give up our weapons and then the army will take care of us. Oh, no, no, they won't. We don't trust that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then there was two, uh, more rad- two more radical groups formed. One formed of primarily interesting Catholic priests and women from the YWCA and a couple of um, more progressive Protestant ministers. And then the more radical group were the, the leaders of the struggle committee, we call them. Uh, the leader was a guy, he wouldn't call himself the leader, but he was, Yun Sang Wan, who died on the morning of May 27th. Uh, he, was edu- he was educated. He'd been running, he'd, he'd got a, d- a degree and so on and come back to train, to teach workers in the evening schools. Can you uh, say Yun Sang Wan? Yun Sang Wan. Mm. He's the one that March of the Beloved was written about. They had a, he, he wasn't married when he died, and then there was a woman in the movement who died earlier, so they had a spirit wedding for them. Mm. That's what it's for. He, um, on May 26th, after May 26th, the army was getting ready to invade. Mm. He knew that. A friend of mine, an American reporter who speaks fluent Korean, mm. talked to Yun. Yun had a press conference. And he said to him, the army's getting ready to attack. And Yun said, I know that. Um, and my friend said, they'll kill you. And Yun said, I know that. Mm. And then why don't you leave? You know, you, you can get out the back way. The army's not blocking all the mountain pass. And Yun told him, if I'm not ready to die for democracy, the rest of Korea won't know how dedicated I was to democracy. And my friend identified his body the next morning. Mm. Yeah. He's a hero to people in Gwangju now. Mm. Um, he never called himself the leader. He called himself the spokesperson because he spoke some English. Yeah. <laughs> but he was really the leader. Yeah. Mm. Uh, no, it was, um, peop- there, by that time, there were 800,000 people in Gwangju. Those in the areas where the fighting was going on, downtown or near the bus station, are on the outskirts, were more traumatized, obviously, by people who stayed at home. And you hear helicopters flying overhead, maybe occasionally hear bullets, but didn't really see the killing. Mm-hmm. People who saw people killed are more likely to have PTSD, for example, than people who just heard about it. Um, so, and one of the myths of Kwangju is everybody was united. They were united in opposition to the military, but not how to get out of that situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were those who were more realistic who realized you can't fight the army, mm-hmm. you know. But they were considered to be sellouts, you know, uh, compromisers. Um, and then there were those who said, we're going to stand up for what's right, even at the cost of our life. But, of course, the fear was it would cost the lives of many citizens as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there were those who tried to keep away, you know, who stayed at home. Uh, they told their kids, don't go out. You know, any young man was being, didn't care if you were demonstrated or not. If you were a young man, you were grabbed. Mm-hmm. They might be beaten to death. Yeah. Seriously. Um, so... Uh, one man I, I heard about when I visited the, the missionary hospital there, a middle-aged man had come on a bus in the Kwangju, not knowing what was going on, to see his son. And the soldier saw him and beat him so bad he lost sight. Oh. Yeah, I mean, he wasn't killed, but he lost his, his sight. Mm. You know, and Soldiers, maybe they were drugs like people in Kwangju say. Maybe they did just so fired up to fight communists that they didn't know what they were doing. I don't These, know. Were they, were they white beret people? Were they Vietnamese vets? Uh, Some of them were, were at least, yeah. yeah. And one of the things the Army did, they made sure among the, the enlisted people, not the officers, nobody came from the Kwangju area. Mm-hmm. They moved them out of their units because they didn't want them to recognize any of their high school classmates. Some of the officers are from Kwangju, mm. but not the enlisted people. Yeah. And with all this going on, Don, you decided to go to Guangzhou. Yeah, I did. Yeah. 
and and so maybe some of us we, we've watched the movies and yeah, we've seen yeah. the german journalists yeah, like yeah. trying to sneak their way in there yeah. you actually did that yeah, I, um, slightly different time, I guess, but yeah, it's not too long the, the, after the open killing had stopped a couple of hours earlier. Um, but they still the army was still surrounding the city, so I'd gone south first down the, the coast to Henam, came back up, um, but the evening of the twenty sixth at Henam, um, heard that the city had been recovered on the morning of the twenty seventh, took a country bus. They could only go as far as the outskirts of Kwangju, and then I followed a bunch of grandmother types carrying bags of rice over a mountain trail. The army didn't block the mountain trails. Uh, that's how we got in. You kind of looked very inconspicuous. I've seen photos <laughs> of you in the 70s walking I with grandmothers. I, I, I deliberately didn't bring any camera or take notes, by the way. I didn't want to be too conspicuous. Yeah. Uh, and approaching uh, Kwangju, there's an intersection in Naju, mm. a three-way intersection, a road coming down from Seoul, and then coming up from the southern part of the province and going into Kwangju. I saw three passenger buses on the side of the road mm-hmm. full of bullet holes. Yeah. It took me a long time to confirm what that was about. It took me over 30 years because it didn't happen in the city limits, so it wasn't really covered in the discussion of Kwangju. It turns out some young men on the 20th had grabbed these buses and had gone to try to spread the news of the resistance to the rest of the province. When they heard the army had left Kwangju, they thought the city was totally free. And they were coming back when they were ambushed. Mm. I'm told only seven were killed, but um, I mean, a lot more were wounded, I'm sure. Um, again, I didn't find out what really happened until about six or seven years ago. Mm. What was your motivation? I know you've been uh, there since 71, but right. surely that was a decision. Hearing what you'd heard, yeah. uh, and you know there must be some validity to the the rumors. We, you didn't have internet, obviously, but mm-hmm. weren't you walking into a... yeah. I, the people I stayed with when I was in Peace Corps were like a second family. Yeah, I wanted to make sure they were okay. Uh-huh. They lived right downtown. Um, the guy I call my brother still, he was a medical student at the time mm. in Guangzhou. So I wanted to see if they were okay, basically. That's why I went there. Mm. Uh, I was listening to shortwave radio. That's how I found out what was going on. Uh, I did check with a, a lower-level embassy person who had been Peace Corps, so I knew him. Mm. And I said, do you think it's safe for me to go to Guangzhou? The embassy had ordered all Americans to evacuate. Mm. He said, it's up to you, well, you know, we won't stop you. So I went. Um, and, of course, they were very surprised to see me, the family. <laughs> <laughs> they must have been. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My landlady heard the last the rebels die. She heard the last shots. Uh, her, her home backed up on the back wall of the provincial capital building. Um, yeah, and, and I wandered around for a couple of days talking to people, some I knew, some I didn't know. Uh, and then when I was leaving, um, Again, we had to get through the army lines and get a country bus going to Seoul. We were stopped nine times at army roadblocks on the way to Seoul, but the first time was the scariest. I had stupidly sat by the door to the bus, mm-hmm. and the bus stopped at the roadblock, and a soldier got on with his bayonet drawn, mm-hmm. and he shoved it towards my gut. Then he saw I was a foreigner and said, sorry. <laughs> but then he made all the young men get off the bus and we had to leave without him. Now, I tell myself now they were probably regular yeah. soldiers, not paratroopers. I don't know. Uh, the men looked, I remember the look on their face. They looked not scared so much as stunned. Mm. We can't do anything. What's going to happen to us? You know, we had no choice. I had to leave without them. I'll never forget that. You've talked, you spoke last week and said that these, with no disrespect, these were not brave young men sometimes. These were scared. Yeah, they were. The, yeah. the, the history is sometimes wrong. We Naturally, as we need to do, we need to honor them and we need yeah, to portray yeah, them yeah. in the best light. But these was a lot of, this was a lot of scared young Yeah, they were. People. If you look at actual photos of the people during that time, what you see is people that are really scared. Yeah. And the people I saw still had that look in their eyes when I got there. Either shock or scared. Uh, one of the strange experiences I had there, you know how macho Korean men can be. On the mor- uh, about maybe around noon on the 27th, I met a middle-aged man who I didn't know, mm-hmm. and he lived down near downtown. So I asked him um, what it had been like that morning when the army came in, and uh, there had been a, um, a loudspeaker on a van going to the city saying, citizens of Kwangju, come downtown to save the students, they said, um, and also a helicopter flying overhead saying anybody on the street to be shot. Mm-hmm. This man said, I heard the, the young woman 
and I heard the helicopter ahead, and I was too scared to go. I started crying. Oh. Middle-aged men don't yeah. cry in front of strangers. No. He said, I was a coward. I said, you were not a coward. Mm -hmm. You couldn't fight 20,000 troops with tanks. You couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the attitude, you know. Um, you know but a lot of people looked look at first at these young men with guns. They were scared because they were, they were not students. Mm -hmm. and they were the riffraff, basically, you know, mm -hmm. people who were looked down on back then, you know, Shishan boys and people like that. Um, People with really low-level jobs. Um, some of them had military training, of course, as uh, young men do in Korea. Um, and but they also admired their bravery, and they were willing to fight. But um, they would talk brave, but you could see they were really scared. They really were. Um, my landlady was scared. Uh, my tongue, my, my my Korean brother, I call him, was scared as a doctor. Um, nobody said to me. We were fighting for democracy. They said we were fighting to stay alive. Mm -hmm. That's what they said. And um, one thing they kept saying, too, and I've seen this repeated elsewhere since, why were they shooting at us? Mm -hmm. If you watch the movie The Taxi Driver, you get the same sense of confusion. Why were they shooting at us? They didn't know. They, they couldn't understand what, what caused this kind of violence. Yeah. You know, they'd never seen anything like that before. So people were saying this is worse than the communists. Mm -hmm. I actually had a a South Korean Army colonel, not Special Forces, in Seoul, tell me, Chun Dewan is acting like a North Korean. Mm. That was yeah. the reaction. They yeah. said, even the North Koreans didn't do this to us, you know? That's what they said. Before we come to maybe Chun and uh, America, in Gwangju, Don, um, did you meet... Is Thomas Hitzberger? I, I forget his name. Not in the medium, no. Yeah. Don Kirk or David Dollinger? Am I getting the names? I, I, I met Don, David Dollinger. I, I, I met some of the reporters there. Yeah. But I'm just wondering how many other people were there? Were they, well, of course, the missionaries stayed. And okay. some of the missionaries sheltered people in their homes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Linda Lewis, sorry. Is Linda, Linda and I escaped together. Yeah. yeah. Uh, she's, she thinks I was only there one night. I stayed with David Schaefer one night. Okay. And then I came to see her. Uh, we were both full riders. Uh, and we were on. She, by the way, is the one that confirmed I wasn't imagining that bayonet. She was sitting next to me. <laughs> I said to her one time, Was I really almost bayoneted? Yes, you were. <laughs> uh, so Linda was there. Uh, there were, I don't know, maybe 12 or 15 Peace Corps volunteers. There were more missionaries. They evacuated. Mm. Uh, and also the American embassy person running the culture center evacuated. He was still had orders to do that. Um, and so there weren't that many of us. A couple of the, three of the Peace Corps volunteers helped the interpret uh, for the reporters. Mm. Again, the reporter I knew, the American reporter for the Asian Wall Street Journal spoke fluent Korean. He had a master's degree from Kyung University, so he didn't need me. <laughs> and other guys that had already gotten their stories when I got there. Um, one of the reporters, by the way, after we got back from Guangzhou, he told me, he says, that's it. I'm, I can't be a reporter anymore. I'm going to medical school. Uh -huh. If I can't help people, what am I doing? You know, mm -hmm. describing it's not helping them. Mm -hmm. So he quit reporting. Um, we were all traumatized by it, as you can imagine. Um, but, yeah, uh, Dave Dollinger was the one who got in trouble because he actually, the, um, the citizen militia, we call them, the young men, they needed somebody to help them monitor communications between the, the U.S. military and the Korean military in English. Mm -hmm. And so they brought him in as somebody who could listen to the English and tell him what it meant in Korean. So he was expelled from Korea because of that. Oh, wow. Yeah, the American embassy expelled. Well, the Korean government wanted him out. Yeah. Are, are they listening on radio, like shortwave? They're picking up through pirates. I don't know how they picked it up, but they were. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, So he got kicked out of the country for that. He, yeah. By the Americans. Well, Americans what? were at, told by the Koreans. And yeah. Peace Corps was ended in 1982. Mm. And that was the reason. People say, oh, Korea was too developed. And that's true. But the reason was Gwangju. Mm. Because there was Tim Warnberg, a famous photograph of Tim Warnberg's now passed away. He was a graduate student in Hawaii when he died. A photograph of him helping carry a stretcher because mm. he worked in the in the local health center in City of Guangzhou. He was helping carry one of these wounded people to the hospital. They're meant to be apolitical. I I remember I think reading David's yeah. work and book and things like right. that that he did with Matt Van Valkenburg. Yeah, it was supposed to be apolitical. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We were yeah. always told not to criticize the government, but. What can you do yeah. when you see people killed in front of you? you yeah. Know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, there's, there's a time. Can can you say something about American involvement? Uh, because there mm. there are voices that, yeah. that are very critical. Uh, uh, Shorrock might be one. Yeah, um, yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there are others that take a different view. And so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how after all these years do you understand American involvement? Were they uh, were they complicit uh, and guilty? Were they even holding back Chan and stopping them drop a bomb or? <laughs> What do we understand, Don? 
they could have done more. Yeah. Uh, they didn't do as much as some people think they did to support John. They they didn't like John, uh, but they were, their American interest was stability, not democracy. Mm-hmm. Actually, the ambassador at the time told me later, Koreans weren't ready for democracy then. Mm-hmm. I said to him, they died for it, you know. <laughs> but, <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. But that was the attitude. So they kind of held was their the nose. Was that Gleason? Yeah. No, who was that? Gleason. Gleason. Yeah. Gleason. Yeah. Gleason. Yeah. Thank you. Um, he was a nice guy, but he didn't understand Korea. His whole career had been in China, China studies. So um, the Americans, one of the things they did, they really were upset at the, at the excessive force used by the special forces. Mm-hmm. And so they agreed to let... Chun recovered the city on the 27th with uh, um, 20,000 troops, uh, but they told him you can only use the regular army. You can don't send special forces in because they overreact. Mm-hmm. But, of course, Chun lied and, and used both regular army and special forces. Mm-hmm. And I'm told, I can't confirm this with documents, but I was told that some of the helicopters that brought the troops down were piloted by Americans. Um, but when, you know, when I was in Kwangju, people had heard that the U.S. fleet in Okinawa had sailed to the peninsula, and they thought they were coming to help them. They were really pro-American. They really felt betrayed when they found out that wasn't what it was about. Mm-hmm. It was to, to keep the, re- the rebellion, as Americans call it, from spreading. Mm-hmm. Uh, that really, And then they thought David Miller, who was the guy at the um, American Culture Center, the diplomat, they thought he abandoned them. He was ordered to leave. He got a, a call from the ambassador, you're getting out of there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so they didn't like that. They liked the Peace Corps. They liked that we helped them, but uh, otherwise they felt America abandoned them, um, especially when Ronald Reagan invited Chun Doo Hwan to the White House before Chun was elected, and still a rigged election, but even before that rigged election, he was invited to the White House and mm. treated like he's head of state. That made him feel really betrayed. That was a bit of a quid pro quo deal, wasn't it, getting Chun into the White House? And yeah, and it's a way to get Kim Dae-jung out of, out of death, death row. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it, they didn't think of it that way. They just thought this is a rewarding Chun. Um, it's amazing and, what happens with politics. I know. Revert, you yeah. know, and it's, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because the amazing thing is when Kwang Tu happened, it was Jimmy Carter, the human rights president, who was president. And he was convinced by his military people that there was a danger that what they knew North Korea was not involved. Mm-hmm. Dim Shirak is right there. The documents show that. Yeah. Um, but they were afraid if it spread, mm-hmm. that would be an invitation to North Korea to get it. And it probably would have been. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they were determined to try to contain it as best they could. Um, you ask about the, the bombing. Um, we now know, we knew at the time, we heard in, in 1980, but now it's been in the press. Uh, there was this air base outside of Kwangju that then was joint U.S. and, and, and South Korean. Um, and had bombers there. And I believe it was May 24th. The, the pilots were in the cockpits with bombs and their planes ready to go bomb Gwangju when suddenly they were told the mission's off. Mm. And the Korean press just says that the mission was called off at the last minute. What I was told in 1980 was that the Americans said, don't even think about it. But, but also the Americans apparently had told, the American embassy had told some people, Americans in Gwangju, you might want to think about getting out of there fast. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. But can you imagine bombing your fifth largest city, you know, over internal politics, basically? Mm-hmm. Uh, but again, people in Guangzhou don't know that story about the American um, involvement. They don't know that America tried to ensure it was regular army that came in, because people in Guangzhou know the difference between the special forces and the regular army. They mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. Uh, they um, they don't. You know, people, and what they know is that America publicly didn't seem to condemn Chun because. Um, America would privately, but they didn't want to ruin the relationship with the South Korean government. Yeah. Uh, and so they would tell us in Fulbright, they would send a hand-deliver statement saying, whatever you're reading in the press is not not true. We're not supporting uh, mm-hmm. John this way. Uh, people in Kwangju, of course, didn't know that. And Chun newspapers are saying, you know, America's behind us 100%. Um, so there was that, that uh, feeling that America betrayed them. They had a lot of hope that America would save them. They thought America believes in democracy. And that's what they saw themselves as fighting you know, against a military coup, which they were. America's uh, meant to support that. Right, Human right. Human presidents. And, right. Yeah. And then uh, when I got back from Kwangju, of course, the American embassy was not happy with me because they'd given orders to Americans to evacuate. I went down there. <laughs> but they didn't expel me. <laughs> how does, I, I don't know your personal politics, so forgive yeah. this question, but how does that work in terms of patriotism and, mm-hmm. and, and, and how you feel? Because it's all different for different people. Yeah, you feel yeah. different levels of affinity, but yeah. is it, 
Guangzhou and then America? Or well, how does this put you know work with you, Don? Well, well, first of all, I'm I'm of the Vietnam War generation. Mm -hmm. I refused to serve. Mm -hmm. I was allowed by the U.S. government to work in a hospital instead of serving in the military. I'm a pacifist. Mm -hmm. I'm against war. Mm -hmm. um, I'm glad I wasn't given a weapon in front of you. I'm angry enough to use it. I'm glad I didn't. I wouldn't know how to use it anyway. Um, I mean, Guangzhou is my second hometown. I call it. Yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, now I'm now both American and Canadian. I have two passports. Mm. Um, and I'm very proud of being Canadian. I'm more civilized than the U.S. Can I say that on your podcast? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can. It's quite all right. Uh, but, I, mean, I, I, I know I'm not a Korean, but I feel a special relationship with people in Guangzhou because, first of all. I know what they suffer. They know. Mm. I know. Uh, and they, Guangzhou is the reason I went into Korean studies. Yeah. The, the friends I made and what they taught me about Korea in the early 1970s is far my life, right? Mm. So I really appreciate that. Uh, so, and I'm also very proud, by the way, what the ROK has done since then. I mean, see, when I came here, it was under dictatorship and poverty. Look at it now. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. incredible. Yeah. And even though Guangzhou was terrible, it's a relatively small cost in lives compared to other countries around the world. You know, it's a relatively peaceful transmission to democracy. Is, is there an approximate figure of, of casualties that you like to go? Because I sometimes have to do um, like education at the university. We have to watch these videos. Uh, mm. uh, and they put figures in. I've seen figures into the thousands and tens of thousands. Yeah. Where, um, where do you go? I, I, you, I, well, I used to say that as well, uh, yeah. mainly because there was a city official in Guangzhou whose job was to record deaths. And he recorded 2,000 for the month of May, and he was fired for that. Um, I, I've been told by people who work in the May 18th Foundation, confirmed deaths are about 387. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. of course, there's uh, three or four thousand seriously wounded. Mm -hmm. Now, one problem is for confirmed deaths, you got to have a body. Yeah. And we know there were mass graves. Uh, we don't know how many were in those mass graves. Uh, a lot of the people who are missing are people who are still alive, but they fled. Mm -hmm. They went into hiding. It changed. Even the woman in the sound truck on on May, on May 27th who was saying, "Come down to Kwangju." She was in jail for five years, and then she left and, and didn't want to be known the rest of her life as the woman in the sound truck. So she moved to Kyung <laughs> Uh So we don't know uh, how many of the people that are listed as missing are still alive, hiding somewhere, because mm -hmm. they don't want to be, don't want to, and their neighbors think they're a dangerous radical, mm -hmm. or how many were buried in mass graves. But again, about 387, uh, I believe that's a figure, of officially certified yeah. dead. And again, some of the three to 4,000 seriously wounded died later. Like a man named Kim Young Chul, who was in the YWCA in the morning of uh, May 27th. Um, first of all, he, he he saw his best friend's brain blown away. He he kind of lost his own uh, mental health there, and then he was tortured so badly um, he had to be put in a mental hospital where he lived for three years until he died. Um, yeah, um, there were other cases like that as well too. Um, this might seem like a rather trite question, just going from that, but. I want to ask about representations of Guangzhou since mm -hmm. then, such yeah. as uh, Taxi Driver or right. Hand Gangs, Human Acts, and uh, yeah. uh, uh, Satang, Peppermint Candy. Yeah, yeah, right. And um, because while you were talking about the difference between regular troops and paratroopers, yeah. have you seen Taxi Driver? Of course, yes. Okay. Is that what's happening at the end when he checks the license plate and he opens it up and lets no. them go? Because my students always ask me, what, why did he do that? What's going on? And yeah. so I'm just wondering yeah. if you have any observation right. on these representations that we now see. Well, I would say that film was pretty accurate until the last 15 minutes. They weren't chasing foreigners. Mm. There were a group of foreign reporters um, in a hotel right across from the final battle, mm. right across mm. from the venture capital building. Mm. Now, Terry Anderson, who became famous later for being kidnapped in Lebanon, he was looking out the window and a soldier pointed a gun at him. As, as though he signals, don't look at this. And Terry kept looking, and the soldier deliberately shot a bullet right past him. Mm. Uh, so they all hid in the hallway. But but they weren't um, ch they weren't chasing people. Mm. Um, obviously, they didn't want you taking photos out. They had to smuggle them out. But they weren't checking the backs of taxis and so on. Uh, when I was almost checked when I was leaving Guangzhou, I had some contraband, some X-rays that had been given by a missionary. And this, the soldier started to check my bag, and his commanding officer said, don't check the foreigner's bag. Mm. So I was able to get that, that material to Seoul and give it to a missionary who supposedly got it to the U.S. Congress. Um, and that was just hidden in a bag? That's how you got it out? Or yeah. Do yeah. I, I don't just, ask that question. <laughs> yeah, just, just in a bag, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. X-rays. Uh, so uh, um, I, I would say that what I like about the taxi driver is mm. the confusion. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, and also, people outside of Kwanju, remember the taxi driver goes to a small town and people are talking about those communists in Kwanju? Yeah, he goes and eats the, the, the guksu or something like yeah, that, yeah. doesn't he? Yeah. That's what people think in the rest of the country, even in the rest of, of Toledo. Uh, and so uh, that's what it was really like, mm-hmm. you know, uh, the confusion, why are they shooting at us? Uh, people who are not political got drawn into it, mm-hmm. you know, out, of, out of anger, um, out of feeling need to help the poor people lying on the street with their head cracked open. Um, you know, so, um, yeah, so that's, that's the one I like the best. I, I like the peppermint candy because it shows a, the, an innocent paratrooper being driven crazy by what happens to him there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's it's a very powerful. different film. It is very different. Yeah. I gave it to a student recently to watch. He said, Give me some films, Professor. So I said, Watch that. And he went, what did you just make me watch? <laughs> <laughs> because he had no idea what was yeah, happening, yeah. and it reveals itself very slowly right, as exactly. it unfolds. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Has it become easier or harder to study Guangzhou since then? Because obviously, in you know 80, 81, 82, it, yeah. it's it's not there. But right. are we now in a stage where we can we can look at Guangzhou and we can say this is what happened, this is what didn't happen, or is it? St- Still, a, a, a very mythologized thing where we have to be very careful and, and show uh, reverence to the victims. And, yeah. yeah. Well, history is never definitive. Mm-hmm. We're, we're mm-hmm. always asking different questions of the data, finding new data. Um, and, and, but it is easier now because, first of all, there's an official May 18th Foundation, yeah. uh, and they've been publishing these uh, collections of oral histories of interviews they did like 10, 20, even 30 years after the fact, but still they're oral histories of people who were there at the time mm-hmm. and played an active role, and those are available. I don't find many Korean scholars using them. I've been using them. Uh, for me, by the way, it took me 43 years to be able to use that material because it, I started reading it. Something would remind me of something I saw, and I had to stop reading. <laughs> but now, after 43 years, I'm getting the emotional distance now. I can do it. Uh, so it is easier, but it's still, like, it's still very political. People in Kwangju may not like it if I um, puncture the myth that everybody was united, mm-hmm. right? That's, that's their really their absolute community. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there were people in Kwangju who actually wanted the troops to return quickly because they were afraid of the young men with guns. Mm-hmm. Okay? Um, and you don't want to talk about that in Kwangju. They don't want to hear that. And, of course, there are people on the other, um, on the other side who say that it was North Koreans there, right? And, and if I say they weren't, they don't believe me. I've been, I've been brainwashed, right? I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, and so it is very contentious. I find in teaching history, it's the 20th century that's the most difficult to teach because students have, have very strong opinions about. Uh, but I think that um, we'll never get to a definitive answer. We never know who, for example, gave an order to shoot into the crowd on May 21st. Now, again, they shot at that time because they misunderstood what was happening, but somebody had them put live ammunition in their rifles. Mm-hmm. And those yeah. guns were already pointed at the people. Uh, so who gave that order? Who gave the order to shoot from helicopters? Which the government denied for a long time. We saw them in 1980, mm-hmm. but we they denied it until we found the bullet holes uh, in the uh, the Chunil building. It's called ten story building and bullet holes on the tenth floor from above. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and this is people shooting from automatic rifles, from right? Right, right. Not, not gunships. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and Dave Dollar actually saw that happening. I didn't see the helicopter shooting. Um, and so we're still learning more information. Maybe we'll find a mass grave somewhere. And I say, oh, okay. I mean, the rumors are that some of the bodies were taken to uh, Kyung Sang-do somewhere and, and um, gotten rid of there. Um, and one of the problems, of course, is even eyewitnesses, your, your memories change over time. Mm-hmm. And I've had to be careful using these oral histories to try to make sure that if I'm reading something that one person says, if somebody else was there at the same time, same place, did they have the same experience? Mm-hmm. You know, because mm-hmm. memories shift. Yeah, they and, do. You know, you hear somebody else describe something, you think, oh, yeah, I remember. It's false memory is implanted. Or you see a movie, mm-hmm. and you think what the movie says is, uh, like, there's a, a poem about Kwang Ju by the famous poet Ko Un, mm-hmm. and he has in there a line, that when I first heard it, I thought that sounded familiar, that people greeted people by saying, it's Korean, Anchukko Salakana, you're alive. And I thought, people said that to me. No, they didn't. <laughs> I don't think they did. But I, at the time I read that, it, it sounded like somebody would have said that to me. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think I had a false memory implanted there. Uh, so we're never going to get a definitive story. But I think in another generation or two, there's enough emotional distance. We can, people can study it uh, more objectively without these people. So, oh, no, no it, was, it was North Korean provocation. Or it was all these people... The whole city of Kwangju determined to bring democracy to Korea, which is not, again, what people want to tell you there now, but that was not the case. It was, again, 
the young people who demonstrated, 200 young people, mostly young men, on May 18th were dedicated to democracy. And Yun Sang Wan, the, the spokesperson for the Citizens Militia, he was dedicated to democracy. Uh, but most of the people, again, that was not what they were fighting for. They were fighting to stay alive. Yeah. I genuinely admire the way you are happy, not happy, but you're courageous enough to walk through these veritable minefields. Yeah, they, are, yeah. they are, but and you're willing to say what you think is true rather than what you sometimes think should be said. Uh, yeah. And I think that's an admirable trait. And I, 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 Brian Meyer said this the other week, and I'm sorry to use the name, but he said something <laughs> that might resonate but because yeah. he said the reason people study K-pop and Hallyu these days is because 20th century Korean politics will get you cancer. You can't study that. You'll get in trouble yeah. if you actually study it and, and, you, and you do it properly. And yeah. he, he said maybe that's why everybody's doing yeah. K-pop and K-dramas and Hallyu because it's just so s s safe in academia, yeah. really, yeah. you yeah. know. And so, uh, and so, But I see you here doing it and what you're doing, Don, is, is amazing. Perhaps just as we wrap this up, maybe I'll just ask you maybe one more question or something okay. because I know we could go for hours <laughs> and there is still much more that we haven't spoken about. But Hearing what we've heard, your, your your knowledge of Chinese, Korean, your life, the legacy, what have you learned from all this? Like, as as you know, you, you're talking back 43 years, and yeah. there's there's years before that as well. And younger people will listen to this. Yeah. And and what what yeah. do we what do we say to them? Well, what I've learned from all my time in Korea, even before the Kwangju uh, resistance, that I call it, is that. It, Individualism is not a good idea. You have to see yourself as a member of a community. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you become a better person. You actually benefit more from that. You, you hurt yourself by thinking of yourself as an isolated individual. You have to think about what's good for the people around you, and they'll do the same thing, and so you benefit. And Korea is becoming more individualistic, unfortunately, now, but it's still much more community oriented than you see in say the United States. Canada's kind of in between mm -hmm. the way they do. So I've learned that from Korea that uh, remember you're a member of a family, of a community um, and never think what's right for me I don't care what happens to anybody else. That's what I'm going to do. Don't, you can't think that way. Which is the libertarian position in the U.S. basically. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, If it's good for me, that's all I care about. Mm -hmm. And uh, that doesn't work. I learned that from Korea. Uh, also Koreans have taught me two things. If you work really hard, you can get your goal. In 1970s, if you had told me what Korea would look like now, <laughs> I would have said, you're, what have you been spoken, right? <laughs> I mean, look at it. They worked really hard. They really hard. And also the bravery. Yeah. Uh, I mean, again, those people were scared, but they didn't put down their weapons. Mm -hmm. They knew they were going to die on the 27th. They knew that. Mm -hmm. And still they fought. Mm -hmm. To me, that's incredible. And, of course, those who didn't die were tortured. And still they fought. Uh, and I don't think I could have been that brave. You know, I really admire that. So Koreans have taught me bravery and hard work mm -hmm. and then pardons of realizing you're part of a community, not an isolated individual. And also, just, uh, I feel so lucky to have studied Korean history in my lifetime to see the amazing progress Koreans have made. And, uh, I mean, nobody cared about Korea when I started off. But there were no Hyundai, you know, Samsung, none of that. You know, no no K-pop. Mm -hmm. And the to see the crowds I get in my classes now of students that are not Korean. Mm -hmm. And Korea is now cool, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and so wonderful. I'm so proud of the Korean people and they've been able to watch that mm -hmm. uh, and, and a little bit contribute to that. It really makes me feel good. I, I feel like, my, thanks to Korea, my life has had, it's been a good life. Yeah. Just seeing your eyes light up when you spoke <laughs> about that was, <laughs> was amazing because it, it felt so genuine. I sometimes use the word hangukwa. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Koreanization. Yeah, yeah. And because everybody talks about globalization and modernization, but yeah. I, I started just so slowly using it. I think if you type Koreanization into Google, mm. it's a picture of me and my international students come up. <laughs> okay. Because I tell them once you come here, you some of you will become Koreanized 5%, some yeah. of you 0.01%, yeah. some of you 10%. And what happened to me, Don, perhaps like you is... The West and my upbringing, it, it taught me to stand up straight and shake mm. people's hands and, yeah. and speak my mind and think and uh, and do this. And then I came to Korea and it taught me all the other skills. It taught mm. me all the opposite of that. It taught me sometimes to shut up and mm. listen to that person and, and, yeah. and don't say what you think and think about other people first. And so I, I really 
it kind of filled me in. Do you know mm. what I mean? It, it gave me the, yeah. the um to the yang or yeah, however yeah, you yeah. want to do it. But yeah. I, I feel like you, so grateful for Korea because yeah. sometimes it's not all about I, I, me, me. You want to see Koreanization, go to Hawaii. Kimchi is now part of the Hawaiian diet, right? along with Spam. They love Spam, by the way. <laughs> That's pretty Korean as <laughs> I know. well these days. <laughs> Mr. Baker, thank you very much, sir. It's good. I enjoyed talking with you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And let's relax. Okay. Let's, see, we didn't even look at the papers or questions <laughs> once. It just goes. Yeah. So you mean did I say anything to offend you as a Korean? <laughs> <laughs> I think I said the offensive things. I'm very sorry. I'm sure. well, she's, she's from Kansung, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, how, was, how was that? Did you enjoy Was that okay? Oh, was, yeah. Just, yeah just that's that's I yeah, really yeah, enjoyed yeah, that. Yeah, I, I love that. I don't know how many viewers you're going to get for this. It's a long one. We've talked a long time. So. I do it for myself. No, okay. I do it because I spend all my day talking about Korea, and I need to sometimes sit down and not be the smartest person in the room and listen. And mm. you know, I, I get to learn. I get to sit and learn. I came to Korea a lot when it looked quite different than it did when you first came here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 18 years for me, but I'm so fortunate. I mean, I get to sit with you and Peterson and, yeah. and, and you know, Shields and I try to get Kirk on, yeah. but then I also sit with the young Koreans, yeah, yeah, and the pop stars and just have exactly the same conversations. You, you can't imagine what it would be like to walk through the streets of downtown Seoul and see soldiers with drawn bayonets on every street corner. Yeah, I was so crazy in June 1980. I walked up to the soldiers and said in Korean, Why are you acting like a North Korean? <laughs> That's what everybody seems to tell me. It was like North Korea here sometimes, yeah. you know, yeah, it was yeah. more like North Korea than we like to, to imagine. Yeah. Well, actually, we had mass games in the 70s. And the placards of President Park. <laughs> I've seen the ones of Chun Doo as well. And they oh, call yeah. Him Kaka yeah, and yeah. Your Excellency. We never called him President Chun in Kong. He was always General Chun. <laughs> General Chun. You, you just said um, if uh, people had told you where Korean be now, you'd say, what are you smoking? Yeah. <laughs> was there much Was there much Demacho around? I don't know if the, you're the right person to ask, but I heard stories that it would grow naturally. Oh, it did. Yeah. They called it uh, Yen Al Tambe. <laughs> okay, yeah. It was, well, funeral clothes are made for marijuana stalks. Mm. So what do you do with the leaves? You can't afford tobacco. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You smoke the stuff. Yeah. yeah. The, the rumor is that it was legal until a Puck, a Puck, a Chung Hee's son, Puck Simon, started smoking it. <laughs> oh, is that right? I never heard that story. Yeah, I, I never confirmed that's the rumor. Yeah, 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 yeah. But he came out hard in sort of 74 or 75. That's he what put it was, yeah. Shin Jung Hyun yeah. in jail, yeah, musicians. Because yeah. yeah. I heard it was Shin Jung Hyun wouldn't write a song for him. That could be too, yeah. yeah and so he be. said, yeah, right, yeah, I'll put yeah. you in jail. Yeah, then. Yeah. But that's yeah, it was legal. It was, it was part of Chinese medicine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, opium was too. Mm -hmm. Had a headache, it's opium. <laughs> I didn't know about the opium. I mean, because, a little small bit. Yeah, you didn't yeah. get high from it. You know? Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I remember the fish court volunteers. This is we were coming out of the late sixties or seventies. Come to Korea. Wow, it's growing right there. Growing right there. <laughs> mm. Max Hastings says in his book that when the North Koreans got prisoners of war, British and American, yeah. every night they were singing and laughing, and they didn't know why. <laughs> And they were like, what's going on? <laughs> <Because> they, <laughs> and it, it turned out they were sitting in a big, like, temperature field. <laughs> That's like an American folk song from the 60s. I met the enemy and, and we got stoned. <laughs> it's like a Bob Dylan song. Or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because my students can't believe it with everything that's going on now. Yeah. You go back yeah. 45 years and it's completely different. Totally different. Totally different. Totally yeah. different. Yeah. Thank you for confirming that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's but, I saw Steve Seals talking about something I saw too the stopping young men on the street and cutting their hair. Yeah. And measuring women's mini skirts. Yeah. yeah. They did that. I saw it happen in the early 70s. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it was all very strange. Yeah. And now they've all got crop tops. And I know. And I know. <laughs> <laughs> crop tops is an interesting one for me because I've been here 18 years and I've seen all the development. But they've always still been, and yeah, they right, right. won't show the shoulders. Right, right. They'll do the hot pants and legs, yeah. but now, yeah, I know. They've gone crop tops. Really, really changing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to stop this. Oh yeah. Thing. Two and a half hours. Wow. <laughs> the camera's got a lot of storage. Huh? Yeah.